Ah, I can record the gun. Okay, uh, um, good evening, fellow commissioners and the uh, general public. Uh, uh, by the way, Mary Pauline will uh, uh, ask you, can you pull out the uh, uh, script there and uh, do the, the back and forth, please? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. Uh, 734. Um, allow me to. Uh, uh, good evening, fellow commissioners and the general public. My name is Mike Champness. I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Commission. Before we begin, please note that this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to the county website and on YouTube. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by the new state legislation and FOIA, the Transportation Advisory Commission needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It's cumbersome, so I ask you in advance once again for your patience. First, because each member of this commission is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all the other members. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues. I will ask each commissioner member participating in this meeting to state your name and location from which you're participating when I mention your name. Uh, at large, Linda Sperling. I am present in Clifton, Virginia. Okay, um, Braddock District, uh, Kevin Norris. We'll come back. Drainsley District, me, Mike Champus, I'm in McLean. Um, Hunter Mill is vacant. Uh, Mason District, uh, Recording Secretary, Roger Hoskin. I'll come back to Roger. Um, Brilliant District, Pete Sitnik. I saw you there, Pete. Unmute. You're on mute, Pete. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, no worries. There you are. I'm here. Okay. I'm in Mount Vernon District. Okay. Um, Lee District, Alexis Glenn. Good evening. I'm here in Alexandria. Fantastic. Welcome, Alexis. Um, Providence District, Jeremy Hancock. Hi, Jeremy Hancock in Falls Church. <laughs> Welcome, Jeremy. Um, Springfield District, Eric Leo. Present in Springfield District. Uh, perfect. Right, fantastic. Sully District, M. David Skiles. Present, Chantilly, Virginia. Oh, fantastic. And the Fairfax Area Disability Services Board and our Vice Chair, Mary Pauline Jones. Present from my home in Herndon. Okay. I'll just go back up the list just to see if uh, uh, Kevin Morse from Braddock District has arrived yet. Or Roger Hoskin. Okay, um, let's continue then. At this point, I will pass the virtual gavel to uh, um, Vice Chair uh, Mary Pauline Jones so that I may be heard to make the requisite motions. Thank you. I accept the virtual gavel. I now recognize Commissioner Champness. Uh, thank you. I move that we have determined that each member's voice can be adequately heard by each other member of the commission. Uh, you have heard the motion. Is there a second? Uh, thank you. It is second. Um, is there discussion on this motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say A. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, I next move that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for the commission to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. I further move that this commission may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated audio conferencing line and that the public may access this meeting by web WebEx online platform or by calling 1-415-655-001 or 1-844-621-3956, toll free and entering the access code 173-868-2237. The phone number for ADA is 711. Access information is also available at the TAC website at uh, fairfaxcounty.gov transportation TAC meetings. It is so moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. In a second, is there a discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, finally, I move that all the matters on the agenda previously furnished and posted on the TAC website are necessary for continuity in Fairfax County government and or are statutorily required or necessary 
to continue with operations and the discharge of the commission's lawful purpose, purposes, duties, and responsibilities. Is there a second? Second. All right. A second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Chairman, the motion is carried unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I give you um, back I the uh, virtual gavel. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, uh, uh, Vice Chair Jones. <laughs> I did notice that uh, um, Commissioner uh, Morris has arrived. Uh, uh, Kevin, can you uh, please uh, check your communications and let us know where you're coming in from? In the uh, Braddock District, uh, Burke. Okay. Um, uh, Roger Hoskin, have you arrived yet? Okay, uh, let's continue on. Um, okay, um, hang on a second, I lost my page here. Okay, uh, well, let's start the tax business for, for the approved agenda. Um, I have no remarks to give at this time. I'll do them at the, uh, the end of the meeting. I would welcome our, uh, uh, any members of the public that are here. Um, our primary uh, uh, participant tonight, obviously, uh, uh, Deputy County Executive Rachel Flynn, and obviously also uh, Tom Bassani, the uh, uh, Director of Fairfax County Department of Transportation. So welcome to you both for, uh, uh, for coming. Um, it appears that that's who we have. Um, and so the next item on the agenda is acceptance of the October 20th meeting minutes. Uh, they were uh, uh, provided um, a little bit earlier this evening by uh, uh, Calvin Lamb. Um, I would entertain a motion to uh, uh, approve the minutes. So moved. Okay. Uh, uh, Giles, okay. Any seconds? Second. Kevin. And who? Uh, okay. Fantastic. Um, now there's a motion on the t on the floor, seconded, to approve the minutes. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any uh, uh, adjustments or changes we want to make to the minutes as put together? <laughs> Okay, Roger, I see you've arrived. I'll okay. note you on the uh, list. Can you confirm, Roger? The well, let me finish the vote. Um, so, if there are uh, no discussion on the motion, then let's move to the approval of the minutes. All those in favor of approving the minutes as printed, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Nay. Okay. The uh, uh, the motion carries unanimously by uh, by voice vote. The meeting minutes for October twentieth are approved. Um, let me just go back for a moment to uh, Roger, confirm your uh, uh, connectivity. Roger Hoskin, can you please identify yourself and confirm that you can hear us and tell us where you're coming in, dialing yes, in from. Uh, uh, I am Roger Hoskin and I am here in beautiful Falls Church in Mason District. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. With that, we have dispensed with the administrative portion of our uh, um, activities this evening. Um, we have uh, put but one item on the agenda tonight, um, and it's a, a special guest, our Deputy County Executive. Um, she wanted to put together a few charts for us. Uh, those few charts are actually 152. Um, I hope she doesn't go through them all, but I, I skim through them all, and they are fascinating. Um, lots of pictures, lots of history. Um, but honestly, uh, uh, Rachel, I know you've only been living here for a little while. Uh, you know far more about the history of Fairfax County, I'm sure, than many of us have been here for uh, for many, many years, and we appreciate that. Um, with that, um, I would actually uh, turn the floor over now to uh, uh, to our Deputy County Executive. This will be a discussion. Um, you know, obviously, be respectful of our colleagues. We will do that. Um, uh, I'll let Rachel set the ground rules. I'm sure she's you know looking forward to talking with us about this. So, Rachel, let us know if you want to sort of pipe up as you go along, or at the end, or however you want to handle it. But uh, Rachel, thank you very much for coming. And again, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate the invite and the opportunity to speak to the TAC, the, the new TAC. I know some of you have, have joined of late. Um, so congratulations on your appointment. I, I think transportation is one of the most important issues uh, that Fairfax uh, deals with, given our magnitude of um, what 400 uh, plus square miles and 1.2 million people. We really are a small country, kind of like uh, Luxembourg, I think, something like that. Maybe there, maybe there's a country smaller than us. Um, 
I'm going to try and share my screen and see if it works. You might need to help me. Um, Calvin, let's see my uh, screen. Yes, you will be able to share your screen. There we go. Okay, I didn't and want... you just need to open the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Let's see. There we go. Okay, that should work. Everyone can see it. I can see it. Yes. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, so as, as you can see from um, these images, there's a strong link um, between transportation, land use, and economic development or economic vitality. You can't separate how streets are designed and how they function from land use. The two are, in my view, inextricably linked. And then what happens as a result, whether that that land use is a farm on a country road, or it's um, the beltway going through suburbia, or it's an urban street where you um, have the activities that you see here, but it's so important to get it right. And so uh, what I wanna talk about tonight is um, the history of um, how we got to where we are in Fairfax and the interesting time that Fairfax came online as it were, in the, when it started its explosive growth in the 50s and 60s, what was happening um, across America and, and the world, really, with the um, proliferation of car use and how that then affected us and, and where we go today from that. Because we have to be thinking about all these things when we think about transportation. Uh, da, 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 how do I? Oh, okay, I thought I could use my arrows, but here we go. So, um, as you can see here, uh, dating back uh, really the 1600s, but I don't have a map going back that far. You, you can see the wide variety of, of uh, mapping types and uh, land uses and densities uh, over the last, um, what would we say, 300 years. And um, it's real, I think it's, it's really fascinating. So one of the things I like to do is look at the first map of, of the place, wherever I live, whether it was Richmond, Virginia, or Oakland, California. And this is the first map I'm aware of uh, in the county. And it was developed by Fairfax himself. I don't think he had even been to Fairfax yet. He was still living in England, but he had this commission. And um, as you can see, uh, this is a close up of it. That, area I've shaded is actual Fairfax. Um, it's just really uh, cow paths, probably some Native American trails that then the colonists uh, started to use uh, more frequently uh, for horses, for walking horses, wagons, whatnot. There wasn't much around. Interestingly, the first courthouse was in uh, Tyson's and here's Falls Church. And then you can see the beginning of Route 1 that um, I'll talk about in a minute. And, um, but the rest, it was just nature, right? Um, not, not much going on here. This was not like DC, a big uh, planned area. Um, interestingly, we've always kind of been that place where people go through. And uh, this is an example of that with the King's Highway. Uh, there's one on the East Coast and there's one on the West Coast. The one on the West Coast has a Spanish name, El Camino Royal, and we have the King's Highway. In fact, they're still there in the uh, Lee district. Um, and they started at the colonial capital of Williamsburg, it came up through Fredericksburg and through uh, Fairfax to get over to Annapolis. But that was really the only thing. There was a small ferry at uh, Colchester, but otherwise there, there wasn't really a lot going on uh, in Fairfax. We were not a destination. Um, the first thing that really became a destination was the creation of Alexandria. And this was George Washington's plan, the first plan in 1749. As you can see uh, from here, it's about four by eight blocks, very carefully planned out. It was very similar to most colonial cities in America. Um, uh, even Richmond's plan is just like this, Fredericksburg, Linford, a lot of the Virginia communities. Uh, so two to three acres per block, very walkable. It had to be, right? We didn't have cars or trains. so. Either you had towns or you had farms and forests. That was basically the way humans developed over the last um, five to 7,000 years, however far back you want to go. Um, this is the first map we know of with the uh, trains. So this was the Alexandria uh, Loudon 
and Ham Alexandria Loudon and Hampshire Railroad that came uh, through Leesburg into Alexandria, and then the Orange and Alexandria that obviously came up from um, Orange County. And that started to influence development because once you put a major transportation, a piece of infrastructure, then uh, humans start to settle along that route. The next one, um, you, and you can see here in a, a 3D, um, as it were, you, here's Leesburg here. This is the railroad coming into Alexandria. And this is us. It was just um, country, country living. It, it really, again, there wasn't really a place there except a few crossroads, some railroad towns. And that was about it. You can see DC here across the river. So in rural Fairfax, again, land uses were just farms and forests and small towns and villages. And that was because we had country roads where two of them met each other. That, that was the crossroads, literally Bailey's Crossroads, how it got created, Annandale. And then, of course, um, the railroads. And so these are some of the towns that formed because of those transport, uh, transportation infrastructure pieces. But what's interesting is how they were uh, spread apart. So. Back then, again, you could only travel by uh, by foot, by horse, uh, train, or ferry. So people travel about three miles an hour, and that influences how far you're going to go. And um, horses can travel about four or five miles an hour unless they're trotting or galloping. So towns were typically five uh, miles apart because of that, and how much you know you wanted to spend for an hour to get somewhere. Um, of course, railroads changed that. They um, started slower, but they um, could go, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour. So that really started to influence how we developed um, as people. The only ferry I'm aware of that we had was at Colchester, and that then got to got moved to Occoquan. It actually filled in because of the river. And uh, this is basically what Fairfax looked like. <laughs> so here's the farms. Here's the forest. Here's the country roads, and then you see this little thing called the automobile, and that changed everything. So this is Route 1 here, and there's a street called um, Hopkins where the Catholic Church is. That's what uh, uh, that corner is. This, uh, And then, of course, we had grand estates that the wealthy um, lived in, Gunston Hall with um, James uh, Madison, and then, New or, I'm sorry, George uh, George Mason. And then, of course, GW's estate uh, going back to the 1700s. And of course, they were set in the beautiful farmlands uh, surrounded by forests. And then this was one of our first towns. This is the town of uh, Fairfax. That uh, its first name was Providence. And uh, uh, the Rave, this was part of the Ravensworth land. It's one of the biggest uh, land grants that was given in Fairfax. I think it was like 24,000 acres. And uh, that family slowly subdivided it over the years, but they obtained it in the 1700s. And here's here's the town plan. It was just six blocks and they're all still there today. You can see the town hall. This is Little River Turnpike. So it's nice to see that we still have uh, some, uh, some of our history remaining. We don't have a lot of that here in terms of the built environment. This is uh, the Vienna. Um, uh, railroad station that and um, I don't know that that building is still there, but that was how the old town developed uh, Herndon. And then um, you could see that Fairfax uh, continued to grow. This is a map during the Civil War, which is why you see so much activity here because of the battle bull run um, and then some of the forts. But you can just start to see there's more um, more roads now starting to fill in a little bit, but keep in mind how big this area is. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. This is a huge landmass here. Just for comparison, that's Old Town, Alexandria, and then DC. So there was a lot to fill in. Of course, Alec, uh, Arlington is right here. So we have some crossroads coming up, Annandale, Bailey's Crossroads, that kind of thing. But otherwise, it's pretty open. And these were the major roads, uh, Route 7, Leesburg Pike, very historic road, um, Route 50 that turns into Little River Turnpike, and then uh, uh, Route 29 that went all the way up near Falls Church, and of course, uh, famous Route 1. And then these two green lines for the, for the railroads that came in. So 
this was really where development happened was along um, these uh, corridors. Then it starts to fill in even more, more and more. And then you start to see all these little towns of, that we, we know their names today, whether it's Lorton or Drainsville or Maryfield's actually on here, right? I'm right um, sorry, in this area. Well, that's sort of interesting. And then um, again, it, it was very uh, rural country. This is uh, Route 1 as it further develops, but it, this, this was no DC, you know, this was, this was out uh, in the rural parts of uh, Virginia. Then um, we have urban areas that develop in a very different way all around us. And the real difference is that they were planned and Fairfax was not. Fairfax happened by, um, it, it just sort of evolved as people decided to subdivide their land or um, build a turnpike because that was, those were privately funded. And that's how it got the name, because there was a pike that would block it and you had to pay. And if you wanted to keep going, then they would lift up the pike. So it, it was a very different way of developing that in the community and didn't come together, lay down a major grid and then start um, a whole city. It, it was uh, completely different. So this is, um, again, the map of Alexandria. And you can see now it, the one I showed you before was just this core. And now look how far. It's grown. It's probably about, I don't know, probably 10, 10 by 12 or 15 at this point. And this is uh, what it looks like. Um, remember, DC was just being um, built at, at this point. It had been planned in the late 1700s and was just starting to get built. So Alexandria was the place. And you can see all this commerce happening on the River, it's there because of the port. It went down to the river as opposed to Mount Vernon, where you can never of a port because you were up on the cliff. So the topo and um, its location really determined where it was. And then right across the river, of course, DC, Lafont lays this out. And what's interesting about this plan is all the major buildings have radiating streets coming off them. And then where two of those co come together, you typically get a great public space, but it's one of the most unusual plans in the world, if, uh, in America, if not the world, and um, we we're fortunate to have it in our backyard. So this is what it was like um, about 100 years after it was planned. It's still very walkable, and you can see a lot of pedestrians around streetcars uh, came into being in about 1890, the uh, electric ones, that is. They had always had uh, horse-drawn ones. But now you start to see, again, this uh, machine called the car, which changed everything for cities. Um, you can still see horses. Here's a horse. You can see a bike. Uh, there's no metro. But other than that, uh, it's pretty multimodal in this area. Um, and that was really critical. And so I just wanted to, uh, as a slight sidebar, this is a really important book if you're interested in the history of um, America's streets and how we evolved, written by a UVA professor named Peter Norton of Fighting Traffic. And what he talks about um, is how our streets were really for the people. Um, everybody used them. Um, this is probably an extreme because it's in New York City um, and the Lower East Side, but they were great public spaces. They were playgrounds, they were markets, and you went through them. But that all changed um, with the car coming in. But what's interesting is people still use the street as if they owned it. Pedestrians really own the street. And that had to change when cars came because of their speed, really. Um, this is a, um, oh, looks, okay, good, it will work. Okay, I just want you to watch this video. It's really fascinating. This is San Francisco and how people use the street. And uh, they just, they just own it. They come out of nowhere. Um, there's no rules. You cross where you want, um, whether you're a car or whether you're a cyclist or whether you're a pedestrian. Um, the streetcars obviously have to stay in their lane because that's how that works. But it was a, a very different kind of place. Um, and it's funny how we're getting back to that. We're getting back to what are called shared streets where we let pedestrians um, on the streets as well as cars, but the key is the speed. And so when the speed changed, that's when rules had to start um, coming in. 
Uh, Rachel, if I could, uh, on the, the video you just showed, um, the, yes, that's San Francisco. My understanding is um, uh, that was taken about three weeks before the, uh, the earthquake and the fire. Oh. Um, so it was, it was just before the, the earthquake in 1906. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. I was at a party out there and it, they were playing it on the wall. So I took a picture, I took a yeah. picture. <laughs> there's, a, there's a group that uh, a sort of a uh, electronic chill type group that uses that in a, in a video. So um, I'll, 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 I'll send it along there at, at, at some point, but it's, uh, it's a fascinating video. Oh, I'd love to see that. So cars were not very well liked. Um, you can see here, uh, it's a menace um, and because of the speed. And um, here you can see a car is run over children. This was a huge issue with kids because that image I showed you with all the kids playing in the street, they didn't stop playing in the streets. And so people's behavior really had to change. Here, they, this guy calls it the death meter So Brooklyn would keep track of how many people got uh, killed or um or injured uh, in that year so it was very much on people's minds because it was so new and then parents started building monuments to their dead children who were victims of automobile accidents and then what happened is um the president had to step in and said we've got to form so he formed this national conference on street and highway safety and the dominant groups were the automobile manufacturers and what they said is you have to stop blaming the cars, you have to blame the pedestrians. Because if you blame us, then that's going to cost us a lot of money. So they had to change the laws so it was the pedestrians' fault and that they had to get out of the streets. That the streets now really belong to cars. And pedestrians could cross at certain places. So playing in the streets became a real no-no. Jaywalking came from the word. So Jay was a joker. You were a joker if you walked anywhere in the street. You sophisticated people crossed at the crosswalk. And these are, you can look at this later. Um, you all have this presentation now with the funny thing. So this is a uniform for jaywalkers. The person's wearing two mattresses. Uh, this is the jaywalkers clubhouse at the hospital. So they really got people to walk in at the crosswalk. And that, that was a real shift. So um, this is an image of um, that kind of street that was very, very active. At this point, people are crossing the crosswalks, except if you had to go to the streetcar, then you just went out in the street. But it was when a pedestrian was still king or queen uh, before it all changed. So this exact same image, um, I work there 100 years later um, in, in Richmond, this is the exact same scene. And the reason is we took the pedestrian out of the formula and then we tore down buildings for parking lots. We got rid of the on-street parking. We really changed it. We put in things we thought would help like convention centers and they do to some extent. But this was not like, I just went out on a typical uh, day of the week and uh, th this, is, this is what happened. And so here's another one. This is back to DC. You had seen that earlier image. By 1940, it was still pretty vibrant because they still had streetcars, which was huge. And, um, but at, at the same time, uh, these got, most streetcars got pulled up in the 1940s because the automobile uh, took over. These were privately owned. They couldn't, they weren't sustainable. Um, cars were sustainable. So they really put the cost onto the individual. This government didn't sub subsidize individual cars. We bought one. And um, as a result, that changed how cities, um, uh, developed. So in the DC area, this is the 1950, the total DC area population, one and a half million. We're now up to five and a quarter. This green line is DC. So you can see DC's population is going down. And then it doesn't start to go back up until about the 90s when urban uh, renewal really takes form. But you can see we're at the orange line and you can see what happened. We became Suburbia became the dominant force. Blue is Montgomery County, and this uh, maroon color is PG County. So it really um, shifted how people live, where they live. And um, this was DC. It, be it became just a different kind of place. Um, you know, it, was, it got poorer, there was blight, there was crime. Uh, the federal government obviously stayed and survived. I, I think the streets are wood here because of uh, Metro but uh, it really shifted. And 
And then when Metro actually came in, everything changed. So again, when when transportation is done uh, correctly, we really have great results and vice versa. And, and Metro was just remarkable when you think about the investment that was made. And I know when I started, uh, I grew up in Silver Spring and I remember my parents taking us down and this, I, this was the only line was that U shape. It was so exciting. And of course, now it's come all the way out to us and we're about to open all the way out to uh, Loudon. It's pretty hard to believe. And of course that transformed DC, it got cleaner and safer and more vibrant and the investment came back and the history was maintained with beautiful infill development, still very walkable and it's a real success story. Then suburban development came along and you have to remember this was something that in the history of humans, um, we never had ever, ever had the kind of uh, land use development, Euclidean, where we isolated land uses uh, where we were uh, car dependent, where we um, would go further and further and further out because we could because of cars. Um, and it, it really changed everything, lower density development. So um, we can see here, remember the Alexandria plan that's on the right. This is the Fairfax plan. And so it was really based on major arterials. Uh, this is the Beltway, as you can see. And then Dulles Access Road is uh, starting to be planned. 123, that was actually a historic road, uh, but that got widened, Leesburg Pike. Uh, and then here's the plans for 66, but that's kind of it. Um, that, that's not a, a lot of planning. Like they didn't think about how people were going to live and experience, you know, the land uses. It was really about major uh, road infrastructure coming in. So zooming in, this is Tyson. So here's the Beltway. Uh, this is seven and here's 123. And this is about the size of Old Town Alexandria, this triangle, if you were to take the rectangle of Old Town and turn it into a triangle, but they're about the same size. But instead of all these blocks, which were two or three acres big, now you have these huge land masses. So people were just buying an entire farm a single user rather than a whole community and making one use out of it. So you can see here, even in the planning, they're like apartments, this will only be apartments. And then convention center, this will only be a convention center. And then industrial. So the, the, it was Euclidean zoning, a famous land use case that went to the Supreme Court, Ambler versus Euclid. Euclid was a town in Ohio. Ambler was a real estate developer, said uh, the town didn't have the right to do it. The Supreme Court said, yes, they do. And it became that forever after known as Euclidean. And, and you can see here, this was the first subdivision. This is uh, Pimmet Hills, but how, um, how isolated each use is. The, it's not set up like you saw with Alexandria. And then of course, the associated transportation is major arterials. And remember when the Beltway went in, it was four lanes and they never thought we'd have traffic like we have, but it just, it, it had never happened in, in history to have traffic like that because we were experimenting with, with new inventions. So this is um, Pimmet Hills. Again, they just bought a farm and then put some houses, but you notice how it's not connected any, to anything. So you have to get in your car to go shopping, um, probably to go to school or school bus, and then um, to go to work, of course. So it, it was just a new way of living, but we thought it would be fine because we had our car. What was the problem? Um, By the way, then, I'd like to back yep. to your, your, uh, your one about the, uh, the Beltway there, just for a uh, um, uh, placement in time. Um, 64 years on the Beltway started, judgment of the age of the car is that taken about 1973. So even as late as 1973, we were having two lanes on the belt, uh, each way on the Beltway. Yeah, yeah, I do have I'm a photo that here. taken in the 70s, so that must have been yeah. a, a late, later 70s, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so um, sure, and then we have, um, so the housing, the other thing, so you always have to tie in the economics, so the government gave subsidies to allow for mostly uh, veterans to get uh, subsidized housing, um, and that then further fueled um, suburban development, because rather than just get an apartment in the city, they weren't putting money into that, which is why we had so much blight in the cities. They were putting the money into have, you know, have a piece of the pie, get your own home, your own yard. And by the way, 
will help subsidize that. But it wasn't for minorities. It really was predominantly for white people. And then associated with those subdivisions, then you had uh, the shopping that came with it. And again, the Lerner family just bought a big old farm. This was already in. Um, and they didn't have to create Main Street. They didn't have to create the grid. And it's a bit like Battlestar Galactica landing uh, in Fairfax, but it's uh, it's pretty remarkable. And again, this had never been done and you're putting it all inside. And so you can tell energy was cheap. You know, remember when gas was like 20 cents a gallon. And so when you have cheap energy and you can heat a building like that and you can you have tons of cheap land um, and you can provide all the parking. Look at every single spots filled. It's just remarkable. Um, and here it is looking the other way. So again, all, all must be Christmas time. Yes, I know. All the uses got isolated. So an office here, shopping here. You can see the subdivision here. And uh, I doubt many of these people were walking to the mall. You would just hop in your car. And so it started to create a new a new type of, of problem with congestion. And then uh, as a result, our roads had to change. So this was the historic. Tyson's Corner, two-lane country road, each direction, and now there had to be overpasses, uh, clover leaves, the widening. Um, so the the transportation had to adjust to the land use rather than set the transportation and have the land use come. So it, it was a real experiment at going the other way. Here's another one in seven corners. This was uh, one a, a farm. Uh, I've been told it was owned by an African American family. And they sold it to the developer in the 50s. This went in in the 50s, these apartment buildings. But you can see how cut off it is from the adjoining property. And notice here there was a roundabout uh, where we now have overpasses. And uh, this is not uh, accessible to pedestrians at all. Um, and and that, that causes a problem in and of itself. But this actually worked quite nicely until they changed it. Then. Um, the largest and newest shopping center open and people loved it. It was so exciting and shiny and new. This is that same triangle. You can see those apartments there. And we all loved it. I remember when things opened like this when I was a kid, it was very exciting. And you just had this one use and what was wrong with that, right? But I, again, I can tell you these people were not walking over. Um, so, it, and here's another shopping center. So it just created this, this way of travel and, um, just taking care of your daily needs that was very new to uh, to the world. And then again, then the road started having to adapt to that because when everybody has to get in their car to shop, to go to work, to go to the Girl Scouts or whatever, um, you're going, you're going to have to widen it. And we didn't have a grid system. So people were, remember Alexandria, you'd have, you know, eight to 10 streets in here, you don't have any here. And so this, these major arterials have to get really big. And then it's it, it's just hard. That, of course, the consequence is going to be traffic. So then um, a lot of ur uh, urban planners and architects got together and said, you know, this isn't really working. You know, from an environmental standpoint, we can't keep sprawling. Um, you know, we've got to be more responsible. Um, well, people don't want to drive or they can't afford to drive or they want options. We have to come up with a new way. So that was called new urbanism. And they said, let's just get back to what we used to do. Let's mix up the uses. Let's address sprawl. Let's go denser. Let's link our transportation to our um, our land uses. Let's get the street grid back. Let's get people out walking and biking. Let's focus on transit. And a lot of this happened. And actually, to some extent, um, uh, Simon was really uh, the precursor to new urbanism. They called them new towns. And he and Jim Rouse, who did Columbia, were real pioneers in that regard. And they both grew up in cities. Uh, Jim Rouse was from Baltimore and um, Simon was from New York City. And so each of their plans has a core of a downtown, Reston more so than Columbia, but here it was. He never got to build it, but he planned for it. He planned for the jobs here along the uh, toll road. Um, he planned for villages like you'd see in Europe. Um, so he really thought this out quite well. You could get anywhere you wanted on a trail. Um, you know, so kids had a lot more autonomy. If they wanted to go visit their kid, and, uh, their friend who was a kid in the next village. It, it really was um, uh, a, a great uh, uh, masterwork. And 
then um, came the town center. And I remember studying this by now I was in, um, in school and they showed us this and we went, oh my God, what? They're going to build this? Because, you know, this was something you studied from, you know, the 1700s or 1800s. Nobody was doing this out of scratch. It was so exciting. And then sure enough, they built it. It was, it was a big deal and they adhered to the plan. Sadly, Simon wasn't the guy, but he came back and got to enjoy it. So that was nice. And then they didn't just plan it, they built it and it, they actually did it properly. The architecture is good. The public spaces are good. The materials are good. The street trees are nice. This pavilion, you know, is such such a draw for people. The fountain, the amenities, it, it, it really came together and it was very exciting. And Fairfax was at the forefront of, of this change. And then, of course, Wheelie Station, uh, that's become core for uh, dense development based on the metro. And uh, not far from there is um, uh, Haley Rise, which is now going up. These buildings here are going up. It's starting with the housing. And we're going to get another Wegmans, yay. And so <laughs> this, this was all very exciting. Um, and... Rachel, what does the TSA sorry, stand for? I should know. I can't remember. TSAs? Does that stand Trans for? Transit station areas. Is that it? Okay. Sounds? That sounds yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and even if you don't care about the planning and all that stuff, it's cold hard cash. I mean, look what's happening. These are the places that are really keeping nice, um, Fairfax prosperous with, with this kind of growth. And, it, and it's only growing more and more. These are the places where these tech companies want to be, innovation companies, any company, because what, what we're hearing is that the employers say, our, our young employees, they don't want to be out in an office park anymore. These office parks are struggling. You know, these kids want to be uh, where the action is. And let's pray God we get through this pandemic and our retail survives and our downtown survive. And I, it, they will, I'm, I'm convinced, but it's hard to, you know, know all that while you're in the middle of it but let's hope by next year this will be gone but but just look at that with urban urban planning creates wealth this one it was a different situation where it was an old drive-in theater and then they built a multiplex and then this is where you know government came together and the private sector and they planned it right and they worked out a financial deal with the county uh through a tiff tax increment the financing um, and it, it really worked, you know, we did well from it. They did well from it, but this is a, this place was really well designed. I, I just have to tell you, they got the street grid, right? They got the public spaces, right? They put the theater in the right place, right on the park. They put the little pop-up in the right place. They got retail row, right? They've got the housing, right? The scale is right. It is so well done. I mean, kudos to this company for planning this so well and having such great planners and designers. And it too has been a remarkable uh, success story. I mean, just look at that out of nothing. And they own the adjoining property and we're hoping that they will keep expanding. We're gonna be talking to them about it. Like, what's it gonna to take to just keep going? They, they just really need to. And then of course, um, you all have probably heard about uh, our little relay that opened uh, about a month ago. It's all very exciting. and. That's another story I'll talk about later. And then of course we have uh, Tyson's. So Tyson's has always been a very successful um, um, business center, you know, whether it was offices that were in this part of town or whether it was the uh, retail. So retail was always in the core and then the offices were around here. We had some residential with the uh, rotunda, um, but then surrounded you know, by very low density subdivisions. But when Metro came in, <clears throat> they call it the Metro necklace, you can see here, that was a big deal, a really big deal that Fairfax leaders and staff really worked to get Metro to come. And I know there was a lot of angst about it going above ground, but at least it's here. And it really has worked. And when it was definite that Metro was coming, the planners and our DOT and everybody got together and came up with a, a, a really bold plan they divided it into seven or eight areas you see there they came up with different densities and uh land uses um throughout 
and the public spaces, the right buffers up against subdivisions. It, there are a lot of compromises, but it, it really um, turned out to be a great visionary plan that got like one of the highest awards, the national awards for planning that year. And remember, it started with this. It was just a simple country crossroad. You, you can't forget that with Fairfax. We don't have the advantage of a DC where the entire city was placed with planned by LaFont or George Washington, and they laid out a grid and everyone got their, you know, um, half acre of the, of the two, two acre block. We, we just look like this. So we're really trying to work with going from country roads to suburban sprawl to really creating place. And that is not easy. And I think city leaders and staff deserve a lot of credit for getting us here. Now, the downside with this traffic issue is that, you know, this is the, was that two lane country road I was just showing you, but now it's two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lanes. And notice there's no land uses here except auto. And so we're trying to work with VDOT. Our staff is very, very much aware of this, trying to work with VDOT to see how can we start to humanize these streets and not just make car king or queen that we have to start saying that pedestrians have value, cyclists have value, transit riders have value. So when you have all right here, you know, this multi-billion dollar investment that's really working, this has to be the next, the next um, step because we cannot just reward the through traveler. We have to reward place because that's where wealth is created. That's where people want to live. That's what creates community. About a third of the traffic that goes through that's in Tyson's is cut through. And we have to start rewarding cut through traffic. We have to balance it. We realize it's there, but we also need to look at it in other ways. This was the vision for our streets, right? So we have to slowly through good public transit or more of it um, and getting people out of their cars, making those streets so great that people won't want to drive. Um, they'll want to bike and walk. So. This is the vision and, and we're, we're working towards that. This one's already in. So this is at the borough, which is uh, just a block up from the Greensboro Metro. And it's just, you know, kind of brings tears to your eyes that it worked, right? They did all this planning. The architecture is beautiful. They got the ground floor retail with the restaurants came, the retail came. It's a walkable street. When someone, remember when I was showing you that old video, when someone is walking in the middle of a street, you know it's a good street. It's safe, it's calm, the speed is slow, everyone has a right, even dogs. And so this is so important. And uh, it's just it's just great to see this. Here, um, here. <laughs> and again, you have uh, with Tyson's, look what happened. Tyson's is the biggest engine outside of DC for uh, employment and, and office growth. It's a big deal. And so we have to balance the growth of the neighbors who have concerns, but it's also paying the bills for, um, for Fairfax. And we have to keep that in mind. It's where uh, the next generations want to live. They want to be a part of it. So always that balance between different lifestyles and what people want, but it's definitely a changing world. The other piece that's changing, so we've talked about Reston, talked about Tyson's Merrifield, or what we are calling these CRDs, Community Revite Districts. So these are those kind of tired old 50s developments that are now really showing their age and they're, they're just not the draws. They're, they're places where people go who want affordable <coughs> a home, more affordable home, even though those are expensive, uh, a place where you can open up a shop. So a lot of our immigrant communities going to these areas, which, which is nice, but we also want to make sure they're walkable, that they're livable, that these are good places. So one of the main ones is Route 1, and that has been in the planning uh, efforts for a long time because they said, you know, no one's paying attention to Route 1. We need some love down here. So they said, okay, well, maybe one day you, you could get Metro. You can see the Huntington Metro is right there. So maybe one day that could get extended. But in the meantime, what a lot of communities are doing and our uh, city staff and leaders have the foresight to say, how about a BRT, a bus rapid transit? It's kind of a precursor to a streetcar or Metro. And so they came up with a plan and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, stations. And um, that is uh, very much in the planning um, 
uh, realm right now, about 30%. And we're hoping this work will start um, two, three, four years, depending on um, how, how that uh, effort goes. But it's in the very um, foreseeable future. And the idea is that you create little um, districts with each where you see each circle. So that's that's a 10 minute walk and people will walk typically 10 minutes, about a half mile. Um, sometimes a little more, but it, it's what we call the last mile problem. How do you get someone who lives here to not get in their car, but to actually go to that place um, by foot? So you have to make it a nice experience or <clears throat> provide some other means like that little relay that you saw, which is trying to get to that last mile problem. Um, again, this is what we started with, and this is the vision. So great public spaces along the street, but we also want to make sure Route 1 doesn't just become a cut through, that, that we're just rewarding people who want to get from Woodlawn to D.C. This is a real place. This is a community where people live, work, and play, and they, they want the dignity and the quality of life that other places have. So we're really shifting it from the commercial strip to Main Street. And that's going to take some doing. So part of it is slowing the speed, adding the land uses along it. We're, we're adding bike lanes and sidewalks so that they keep people walking and biking. And it, it becomes a whole new place. So we're very excited. So this is pretty much what it looks like today. And it, it'll be a very different place. You're not going to see sidewalks right up against the curb. Those aren't safe. and They're, they're not nice. We're going to, you don't see street trees here. We'll have that. Um, and then right down the middle will be the BRT. Um, this is similar. They did the same thing up in Alexandria, but they um, they have less lanes. We'll have three lanes on each side. Um, and then they um, have this in the middle like we'll have. So we're working on the planting. And, you know, we want to get the details right to make sure this is a great place. But also to make sure that the land uses on that street have a very strong relationship. We don't want what they have today, which is just big parking lots or blank facades or no entrances. You have to have that symbiotic relationship between the street, the public space, and the private space, and where um, sort of that magic happens in a community. This is the um, the section, in case you're wondering. So this is what we have today, and most of Route 1, uh, parts of Route 1, you have um, four lanes. But we're basically going from five lanes in this area to seven. And then the other area that already has uh, the seven lanes will um, just be adding the BRT down the middle. But you can see here the new um, sidewalks, the new bike lanes, great street trees. And then um, we're working now with um, everybody to try and get undergrounding. It's a long story. That's another issue. But um, that, that's one more feature to try and create what we would call a complete street. So what's really important, as I've been talking about, is to lower the speed. So today, Route 1 is 45. That's that's just too fast to make a pedestrian comfortable. Even 35 is a little too much, but we'll take it. You know, 25 is ideal, but that through traffic is going to insist on the 35. So we're working on uh, getting that done. Our DOT is working with BDOT, and we think it'll happen, hopefully within a year. So um, one reason is that with the higher speed, you end up with uh, sound walls. And um, the people who live here can vote to have a sound wall. But if you have a wall, you, you can't have community, right? It's not going to have um, the main street that we've been hoping for. So um, if we can lower the speed to uh, 40 to 35, that does away with the need for the walls. We're, we're pretty certain we have like a 90 some percent certainty of that. Um, but these were the six, uh, five or six areas um, walls were, were planted. The Somebody, other, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Here, we're getting some feedback or something. Okay. That, sorry. That, sorry. Was, that was the sound of the cars. For some reason, oh. those were videos. And so oh, you're for you. Hey, Got hey, it. So, okay. Interestingly, Arlington is working on their Route 1, and that, uh, but the difference between Arlington and, Al and Fairfax is they own their streets, and so they get to design their streets as a locality as they want, except for certain roads that are state roads, and so then VDOT weighs in, 
but it's a different relationship and Fairfax BDOT owns the roads. That's all there is to it, unless they're private. So Reston Town Center, those streets are private. Mosaic, those streets are private. Um, and there's some other places, uh, Fairfax Corner. So, but for the most part, they own them and we really have to you know, work with them to try and improve the streets for people. But this was their plan and it's, it's a little different than our route one, but we are gonna be watching them closely to see what's allowed up there and can that be allowed where we are? Um, and one of the reasons, you know, um, Amazon wanted to go up here is because there's a there there. You know, it's a real urban place. Um, it, it, again, it's walkable, it's dense, it's a place people want to be. They don't, you know, they don't want to be on a, a corridor that's either an office park that's remote and out there or a place that just isn't as attractive. So this is our Route 1 um, and the gateway to uh, Mount Vernon and Lee. And when it was done, they meant well because they were accommodating traffic. But now we're realizing that hmm, maybe there's more to it. Maybe we need to think about the pedestrian experience and how does a cyclist travel here? I mean, there's not even a sidewalk here. And how can we make it a beautiful place um, and make people think twice when they arrive and they go, wow, this is really something. This is the gateway to Route 1 in Alexandria, and it's maybe a quarter mile away. You just basically turn around, and they have 75,000 cars a day, and usually ADT is average daily traffic. Usually it's built on that, and they say, well, you've got 50,000 cars. You've got to have 11 lanes like this, um, but it's like, well, wait a minute. they got 75,000. How'd they do it? And so we can make choices. Um, it doesn't just have to be cars um, getting through um you know at a fast pace it can also be the balance of everybody travel so the challenge right that we were built on a suburban model the reason i'm getting you know, all this history is we just didn't have the advantage of being built on the street grid with close relationship between the street and the land use and all that and um isolated uh land uses with euclidean zoning and that now what's happened and because we don't have a great grid, we're relying on less and less streets for more traffic and we have to keep widening, but we never solve for it because every time we widen, we're filling these roads and that what they're calling inducing traffic because when there's traffic and you know you gotta wait like an hour, you start to change your patterns. You carpool, you take transit, you go in a little later, you go in a little earlier, you start to shift, but when they widen the road, Everyone goes, oh, great. Now it's it's only 40 minutes. I'll get back on the road and, and, and you've just filled it again. So, and these are very expensive roads. So we're just trying to figure out other ways. Can we think smarter and, and save money because it's just not cheap. And our SOV rate is, is pretty high, single occupant vehicle rate. And so ours is at 71%. DC is probably 50%. So if we can get that number down, just that alone, um, that it'll save us a lot of money. It's better for our health, better for the environment, all that good stuff. Um, but these are good measures to have so we can see if we're actually making progress. So remember, we were talking about the Beltway. So within, um, uh, this is the today, right? But they never thought that it would be eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, whatever lanes wide, that, that just wasn't the plan. You know, they, they set aside more right of way so they could expand a little, but they just didn't have any basis, uh, historic knowledge of how these things work. And this this wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't the vision. Um, and even like here, Springfield, uh, they met well when they started with the subdivisions here and here, and then they added a shopping mall. But by isolating all the uses and again, forcing everyone to drive and not create that that town and village that, that we like. It's just it's just made it very, very challenging. And our, our streets just don't have the strong um, relationship. But this is the Springfield Town Center. And so this has now been redesigned. In fact, we just had a, a rezoning tonight for the Fair Oaks Mall, and they have the same kind of plan where they want to make it uh, a community. And so uh, the developer for the first two housing projects are coming in, we're hoping it'll go through. Um, and maybe one day people will actually just start walking more in this area. This street won't just become throughput street, but an actual um, a place for community. 
um, like this. So, you know, this is carrying almost 30,000 cars a day. And because of the way it's designed, the way it feels, these major um, arterials really in DC are just, they're, they're great streets and they create great addresses too. I mean, it, it does a lot for the land value and, and the uh, associated economics. Um, here you can see, it's interesting, Route 7 um, here in uh, Falls Church versus the Route 7 in Tyson's. They're never going to widen this thing. It's always going to be four lanes because they built their city around it. But they also created uh, other a whole network of streets so you can get around more that way. So the Tyson's plan does call for uh, more streets and to build the grid, which is great because then it, it, it will mean we, we don't have to keep widening seven. So right now, I don't know, it's six lanes, maybe eight in parts, but it's hard to really create a main street um, when, when you're getting that wide. So, so here's an example further out uh, by where we are at government center. And it's just, it's too much road. We, you know, and somebody paid for this, by the way, and you're not creating wealth. There's no land. There's nothing built here. Uh, that's a gutter, but this is uh, the sidewalk. There's no street trees. Um, you know, just somebody tried with the architecture, but it's just not coming together. And it's not a great use of land and it uh, leads to speeding. And you don't see any pedestrians or cyclists. And you know, buses go here, but most people take it because they have to for economic reasons, not, not necessarily because they want to. So how can we improve that and make it something that's very nice and desirable? So starting to change here, um, a couple miles away, you have Monument Drive and this developer put in a really nice building, has a much stronger relationship to the street. It's much closer. It's not like 200 feet back. It's maybe 20 feet back, great street trees. I think the road's still a little wide, but at least it's better. I would add on street parking if you not with lettuce. I, I wouldn't have all these dedicated rights and lefts and all that. Bring the street down to size like the one you saw in DC or in Falls Church. Here's another one on seven. We're working on this because West Falls Church Metro is up this way if you go left. So we're working on this, but we don't want to see this street explode. Um, and just add all these lanes. We want it to be a real, a real place. And I mean, people don't even want to be on the street. They actually put up a wall, even though Vida put a, a, a 10 foot wide sidewalk, which is nice. There's no street trees. We're working on that one. We're going to see if they'll let us add those. But buildings need to have a relationship with the street, not not turn your back and then put up a wall. So we're working on that one, a developer a by developer. Hey, Ra hey, Rachel, I had a question yeah. on that one. Actually, this, that one's personal to me. I actually live in the neighborhood behind those uh, townhouses. Um, so we've been involved in that, um, all that development. That's all changing a lot. But it raises the, the, the question that I had about kind of bringing the old and new together. I mean, one of the challenges that we have in this area is uh, lots of new development that happens and all the a lot of the transportation happens within the the square of the development, but it connects to a lot of older properties. I think you have that similar issue with Tyson's and Pimmit and here with an older neighborhood yeah. and a uh, streets where houses were built in the fifties and no one thought that they would ever have to yeah. walk anywhere. And even the sidewalk there that's down route set route seven, um, not very many people use. And so there's challenges of how, how do you make those connections together and, and the, the resource in expanding the transportation beyond the development. I think the issue that we have on this area is even if you have the development and we live half a mile to the metro, you know, then the grid of streets creates more traffic throughout the whole area, but then people don't feel safe walking in their own neighborhoods. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, and so you end up as the same kind of issue you have now where people live very close to the metro and still drive or drive to a location, but just wanted to get your 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 thoughts on how we how we move that conversation forward. Yeah, that's a great. Is it Jeremy? Yeah, Jeremy. Oh, hey, Jeremy. Um, that's a great question. So um, that's something that our DOT is actually working on. It's been terrific, and staff is actually analyzing. So I'll get to how we typically analyze roads and why they've gotten so big and wide uh, throughout Fairfax. It's a thing called level of service or LOS and how we're rethinking that and what so it's really LOS for cars right how long they 
it's, a, it's an engineering thing for delay of a traffic light. But what about LOS for the pedestrian? And, and not so much like speed, like how fast can you run across a road, but what's the experience like, you know? So um, imagine like at this street, if the townhouses actually face the street and you felt a relationship, maybe people are sitting on the porch, talk to them um, or not. Um, you have street trees, uh, which actually slow down the speed because people are paying attention to the environment around them, like that image you saw in DC. So then pretty soon, um, a pedestrian want to be on these places. Pedestrians know where they're wanted. If it's too, if the speed's too high, they instinctively know to stay away because we know how to protect ourselves. Same with same with cyclists. And so we have to set it up so it's comfortable for them. It's beautiful. It's safe. And a big thing of that is slowing the speed. And so that doesn't mean traffic can't get through. Like if you live in Falls Church, you want to get home, you can do that, but you don't have to go 45. If you go 25, you'll get there. Uh, in good time, it might take another minute or two, but look at what you get as a result. And so I, I think um, what we have to do in this area, so like where you're living, Jeremy, or these other ones, how do we change that street environment so that we don't give you just this lousy three foot sidewalk that's right up against the curb, there's no trees, cars are zooming by, you don't feel safe, you're going to get your car to go to Giant, you're not going to walk. It's on us to say, wait a minute, if if we can make the developer put money into adding two double lefts and a right and, and adding a whole other um, lane, which they'll do because they're used to it. It's like, wait a minute. No, we want you to put your money into a better sidewalk in, in an area that's, it, you know, a, across Route 7. It's not even where your development is. But because that ultimately will mean that the people in this area are going to use their cars less. The average trip is three miles or less. So most of us are, it's not about going to work 20 miles away. Most of us, it's those daily small trips. And so if we can cut those down and get people to use their neighborhood, like those um, urban areas we were looking at, whether it's Old Town or whatnot, I think that's going to address the neighbor's concerns that, uh, that you're bringing up. And it, I'm not saying it's easy, but that's how we have to look at it. So actually our staff is looking at how can we not just again look at LOS, but the um, the surrounding areas. So it'd be interesting. We could show you what what we came up with uh, for that area. So imagine if you know this looked like that. You know the the buildings actually face the street. They have a relationship. Everyone's going you know the right speed. They all feel comfortable. And then you know the, the economic vibrancy that um, that results. Um, and we are seeing this in some places. So this is near government center and this is Westchester homes. I thought they did a great job and I'm, I'm seeing people come out now because they feel safe. So they have a decent sidewalk on the street The cars they probably go a little bit fast, but not terrible. I'd say no more than 35. And when you know it, when you see strollers and little kids with bikes, you, you know, you're onto something that, that people feel safe. So, so I think we are getting there. Um, this is a VDOT special. And so, you know, they the reason they have to put in a Jersey barrier and chain link um, is because the cars are going too fast. That's why they're doing it. It's a CYA thing, but slow the, slow the traffic. Why do they have to go 35, 45 miles an hour here? And it's not a nice experience. I see people using this very sparingly, but you know when they're using it, it's because they don't have a choice. And there's a lot of people who live here and work here, like thousands work here and hundreds work or live here. And there's a, you know that mall right across the way. I know they would go there more if it was a nice experience. Bridges don't have to be ugly. Well, right, so where, is, where is that bridge, by the way? Do you remember? That goes over 66, it's Monument Drive. Ah, got it, okay, yeah. So rem Thanks. remember this image, hold on, I'll just show you real quick that. That's the same road. So it's starting to change. Like that's actually really pretty. But then you get to that. And I mean, I, I live here and I just don't want to cross it. I, sometimes I have to do it because I go to the rental car place for, for doing a long trip. I'm like, oh God, I got to cross that bridge. It's just not nice. Um, but this is, and it, it doesn't, costs that much more. You can actually put in attractive fencing. And when you're going slow, you don't have to have a Jersey barrier. 
But the other thing is, who who do you value here? Are you are you valuing just the cars, so the car throughput meets your LOS, or are you saying no? Everyone is valued here. However, you choose to travel, you are valued. Whether you want to go on the sidewalk, if you want to go on this bike lane. And these cars, they're not going more than 25 miles an hour, and it really makes a difference. And so people who were going over to Adams Morgan, over by the Schwarm Hotel or whatever they call it today, they actually will walk it because it's a nice experience. And also just from a civic standpoint that, you know, we think about our parks and, and other places, but people deserve this. People deserve to have real quality in their public spaces. Look how much thought and effort went into this, that somebody thought about these statues and where they're placed. Apparently they came from Italy, they were a different world. And how someone thought about the view at the end when you're driving, what are you gonna see and how special that was, let alone the Lee Mansion at the top of the, of the hill. And cars are you know, going a decent speed, you see a lot of pedestrians, they thought about the lighting, they thought about the width of the sidewalk. People deserve this and this is what we used to do. And we meant well when the car came and we were going out to greener pastures in suburbia, but we lost this. You don't see this in a suburban mall. You don't see this in an office park. And so it's the kind of thing, why we did the Tyson's plan, why we have the Reston plan, why Mosaic was done. You get back to great civic places that, that uh, matter to community and to our citizens. So getting back to this LOS, so level of service, I call it level of stupidity. So our staff is working on whether we can come up with another way to measure. So California actually just changed theirs. It's like illegal to use LOS now because you weren't looking at every mode of travel. They use BMT, vehicle miles travel. So it was a bunch of engineers came up with it in the 1950s. And they said, well, if you wait at a traffic light more than 10 seconds, you get an A. And if you wait more than 80 seconds, you get an F. And that is how we're designing Fairfax. And we're blowing up these intersections to the point where they're so wide, people won't cross them. Instead, they'll get in their car. We're inducing more traffic and it's just not working. And it's costing us a fortune and it's, and it's not, um, it's not uh, practical. So this is what it's designed for. This is a uh, morning peak. And they say, okay, if you're at an F, you gotta blow up the intersection, make a 10 lanes, 11 lanes, whatever. You gotta get that down to a D. We'll accept the D, maybe an E. And it's all for this. And then look at all this space you're wasting. And you have to, and then what happens is cars who are traveling during non peak are going really fast because they have all this road to travel. And we need to shift it um, so that it's not just built on that. And what's important also depends on your perspective. So on the left, um, a uh, traffic engineer would call this an F because you're waiting more than 80 seconds, uh, but they call this an A, but an economist would say it's just the other way around. Like, again, w what's your ultimate goal and, and what are your values here? And we have, we have to balance it. I do realize we are a suburb, and so we are not going to change it overnight, um, but we can gradually get there like we're doing in uh, Tyson's and other places. And of course, this is an example of where this didn't you know, it didn't need uh, a D or whatever. And so they just had to keep that in range. Um, and of course, it's like I said, it's inducing more traffic. So it's my favorite cartoon where it didn't make a difference. Um, and so we're just not going to solve for that. We have to think a smarter. Um, and we, we keep building beyond uh, population and our congestion is growing. So it's not something's wrong, even in the D.C. area. We're not as bad as the national average, but it's still, um, we're just slightly behind population growth, but the delay is growing a lot. So we have to give people other choices and we're driving more. Um, so in the past 25 years, we've added um, uh, four, four miles a day with you know the whole population, that's a lot. Um, the other key thing is growing the green part of this is getting people to live where they work and um, we have some overlap, but more people um, live outside the county and work inside uh, than vice versa or that are, are that are here. So we need to connect people to their jobs and uh, by adding housing and putting housing where you work, that really makes a difference. So like I was talking about uh, replacing LOS, so other localities, even in the DC area, are using other tools besides LOS. So we've 
formed um, a working group uh, with BDOT, and we're looking at, at different options. Uh, it's going to take a year or two or more. This is not an easy thing to change, but at least now we're talking about it and trying to figure it out. And then, of course, there are health and safety reasons. So, um, transportation is now the number one uh, cause of GHG, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, just surpassed buildings because buildings are becoming so efficient now. So, we have to look at it from that standpoint. Um, it's the number one cause of people under 35, not number one cause of death. We don't talk a lot about that. Um, and of course, that's just death, but uh, injuries are extremely high, too high. Um, and then again, all that is related to speed. So the slower you're going, the higher um, uh, your survival rate and vice versa. So so in that regard, we know what to do. And um, But where, where can we have that and what can people tolerate? And then of course, street width, um, has a direct correlation um, to that as well. So narrow, narrow lanes and less lanes um, really have a positive impact. And part of that is our vision, um, as we go slower, our, our cone of vision widens. And so we just, we see more, we notice more. You probably notice that when you're walking down the street and all the things you notice that you didn't notice when you were driving. I, I know I've had that experience a lot. And so there's a thing called vision zero. And we're looking at, at that to see, could we ever achieve it? Um, how do we set up um, goals to, to create that? And then here's some, uh, Route 1 is, is one of the worst. And um, the, these were deaths that we've just had in the last year. Actually, there was just one more. Um, and they're typically where the widest parts of the road are, where you can see these stars. So this was one, and she was jaywalking. Most of them are jaywalkers which is a whole other issue. Here was another, um, you know, the sidewalk's not nice. It's not really focused for pedestrians. It's it's really for car throughput. And she was taking a shortcut. Same with this guy. He didn't want to go up to the intersection. Um, so the themes are, you know, roads are too wide, speeds are too high, but also our blocks are too large that people aren't going to walk a thousand feet to go to the crosswalk. They're going to they're gonna jaywalk. And that's what we're seeing almost all the accidents or deaths. Uh, sidewalks, if they're too narrow or not inviting, people um, either uh, won't walk or, um, or or they'll jaywalk to get off that. And same with bikes. So um, if we're making automobiles the highest priority, then those are going to be the consequences. So we need to start to shift that. Could could everyone at least have equal equal priority? Um, that you know this just this isn't okay. And um, and it's also affecting communities of color and poor. Um, older people and poor people more. Uh, we see it even, in, we did an analysis over the last two years, and the four highest communities with the fatalities were Mason, uh, the Lee, Mount Vernon, the poorest districts, and the ones with the very lowest were the highest, uh, uh, highest incomes. So Drainsville, Braddock, um, that kind of thing. It was uncanny how it, it just followed it almost exactly with AMI and injury death rates. And this was um, a friend of mine actually came in this just shows you how much space we give to cars um, when, when you show it this way. And also how much space cars need uh, just uh, you know physically if you're on, if all of these people are in a car, this is what they use up. If they're on a bus, this is what they use up. If they're walking or biking, this is how much space they use up. So from a practicality standpoint, Cars are expensive to just to fit in either the infrastructure of parking, garages, parking lots, driveways, um, and, and the roads themselves. And also, we don't have a lot of money to just keep spending. You know, in the beginning when trans when Fairfax was getting going, land was cheap, you know, federal money was flowing like milk and honey. It, you know, it was a different ballgame. Now land is not cheap. And we're finding that out with Route One. The right of way costs are going through the roof. And we, you know, federal government's cutting, cutting, uh, state, same thing. So uh, this is a report that was given a couple of years ago. We're going to update it once we know more about what the General Assembly is doing. But it just said no new projects can be accommodated. So, I mean, there's only so much money we have. And if we could think smarter and not just put so much money into automobile infrastructure and shift it, people infrastructure is much cheaper, bike infrastructure, much cheaper. 
And so what, what can we do? So are there solutions? Yes, of course. Totally. So complete streets are really the way to go. You got to think of everyone, cyclists, cars, public transit, pedestrians. This is this so ideal. It's got everyone and buses going by and metros right around the corner. It's just so perfect. Um, and then, of course, uh, with Fairfax bringing metro here, that was a big deal, a big deal. And pray God that we get back to normal after COVID and people start using it again. Uh, we think that the, met the last uh, stations are going to open uh, in about a year, nine to 12 months, maybe, just depending on how it goes with them. But it, it has really transformed Tyson, so we hope the same will happen throughout the corridor. Uh, our Fairfax Conductor Bus Service, um, that has been a, a real uh, important asset for many of our citizens, particularly those who aren't near Metro or who can't afford a car or who just want to use the bus. And we're back up on weekends and evenings. I think we're back up to pre-COVID levels, which is terrific. Um, during um, the weekdays, not as much, but um, a Fairfax Connector really deserves a shout out. Um, this is the BRT plan for um, Route 1. Again, the idea that being in the middle and uh, the, the, the traffic lanes on the outside. And that will be done, I'd say, over the next five to 10 years that will be in place on Route 1. Um, and then we did a countywide transit network study. It's, it's, a, it's a long report, but it's got great stuff in it. It's, it's something um, you all might want to um, put a presentation on in the future. Um, it was very well thought out, and we have to you know, really get serious about that so for the environment, for our health, um, just to get, get people out of their cars. It, it's an important report. <clears throat> um, Capital Bucks here. So they're all over the place now. We have them in Tyson, Boston, Mosaic, lots, lots of different uh, neighborhoods. And so um, I hope you at least tried them. <laughs> it's really great. The more they get used, the more we can add. Because uh, if our numbers keep going up, then we can add more stations. So it's a great thing. And then the e-scooters, uh, the state passed legislation. And that's um, so we adopted um, policy uh, uh, earlier this year. And uh, we don't have them yet, but um, we're working on that, and we hope to have something uh, within a year or two. Um, a lot of places that just never had um, sidewalks, like here, you know, you, you just couldn't walk, right? Or if you did, you had to walk on the edge of the road. And so now we're finally getting um, sidewalks in areas where people have said, you know, I really want my kids to be able to walk to school, or I want to be able to walk, whatever. And um, so that's... Um, slowly happening. Here's another one. This is uh, Innovation Metro Station <laughs> area. Um, this one that connects uh, to East Tyson's area. So now people from that neighborhood can actually walk to Tyson's. Um, this one, it was three lanes. So a lane, a turn lane in the middle, and then another lane. And then um, uh, DOT staff got rid of the middle lane. And put in bike lanes instead and it wasn't easy there were people who just said oh my god what are you doing and they kept at it and and here we are so now people can actually cycle through this part of reston it's um it's a real important asset um new uh trails that are connecting neighborhoods to urban areas so this is tyson's here the spring hill metro and this is uh, what we call the vesper trail so connecting over to that neighborhood and hoping that people, again, they won't get in their cars. They'll, you know, they'll walk on over or bike over. Um, here's some new um, side, a new sidewalk in Tyson's. And while it's great, we have the sidewalk. What we're really aiming for is a complete street. So really the street needs on street parking. It needs the street trees. It needs the other elements that would really get people out of their cars. But, you know, we have to work with VDOT to, again, that balance, because they'll say, no, the cars need this. And it's like, well, maybe pedestrians need this space. Maybe cyclists need this space. Maybe, you know, we need, we need to just balance this. So this is something that's, that's a constant uh, conversation with VDOT. And I, I think we're going in the right direction, but it's just going to take a while to change. And then, of course, relay. So this was not easy. This was like a two-year it was a vision, a pipe dream that they staff just kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. They reached out to Dominion. They reached out to DRPT. They got money. The board gave money. 
they um, planned it with um, um, Virginia, uh, I think it's Transportation Research Council, something like that. And they got everybody to come together. Then they um, got uh, TransDev to be the <laughs> operator. And it, it was not an easy lift. And we're the first in Virginia to have a public um, autonomous vehicle. Uh, on, on public streets, it's, it's a, a it's a big deal. It goes from Dunloring um, Metro uh, on down. And if you want to see it, uh, here's the um, here's the link to it. But you can just Google it, and you'll, there's some videos um, that you can see. It's a really big deal. So complete streets. What's that? Let's get rid of LOS. So really humanizing our streets for everyone. So slow the speed, narrow the lanes, have less lanes. You really shouldn't have more than six. On street parking, shorten the blocks, they should be three or 400 feet apart, good sidewalks, bike lanes, and then shade trees. If you do all those things, that's a complete street. And then people will start walking. The other thing you can do is interim, we call it tactical urbanism. In some communities, they're just doing it themselves. They're just painting the street, adding bike lanes, they're creating parks out of uh, old streets. That was a turn lane or pork chop. Um, what if we did something like that here? You know, put in these chairs and these planters and added the bikes and uh, people would be shocked if they arrived on route one and it looked like this, wouldn't that be fun? Um, or the slip lanes, what if we turn them into little parklets? Um, so we've talked to VDOT about all these and remain hopeful. It, it, it's a big ask, but we remain hopeful. Um, and it also brings community together and gets them engaged. They start to better understand their streets and what the elements are that make for a human humanized street. And then I'll leave you with this image. If this is a complete street, if everything looked like this, we'd have a great, it'd be safe, it would be healthy, uh, it would be economically vibrant, and we'd be using our land in such a more efficient, effective way. And um, ultimately, that's our goal. That's not to say we're not going to have uh, housing out um, yonder in Clifton, uh, out in the countryside, of course we'll have that, but we can do a whole lot more for our uh, denser areas to make them uh, more accessible. And, and we know that uh, millennials, um, in particularly in Gen, Gen Z and Gen Yers, this is what they're, they're uh, looking for. And also employers who want to be in places like this. So thanks for your patience. I know that that was a bit long, but I wanted to make sure you heard the whole, the whole story. And would love for you all to play a part, however you see fit. We really could use your support in speaking out these things. We can tell you when we, we feel like we'd, we'd like you to endorse something or be a part of something, how, however you see fit. You're an important committee, I think. <laughs> well, Rachel, I, I just, uh, a tour de force, as I said. Um, you went through all the slides. It didn't seem that long, although, yes, it was a lengthy uh, presentation, but there's a lot to talk about. Um, it's obviously something you care very, uh, very much about. Um, I will obviously want to let the commissioners here ask questions. I saw uh, electric shocks going through Roger, so I'll let him ask the first question. Um, let's try not to jump all over each other, but please, if you want to. Uh, I give an opportunity to talk. So Roger, we'll start with you and then uh, uh, we'll figure out how to do this and uh, jump below each other. Go ahead, Roger. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah. I can. Okay, great. Uh, I think the, the, the one missing ingredient here that you did not talk about, and I'm sure you have a lot to say about it, is free parking. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I think that's that that <laughs> I think, in the, I don't know what the rules are in Fairfax County, but you have to have so many parking spaces for so many square feet of retail or restaurant yep, space. That's right. That's right. You know, why don't we just get rid of that? Yeah. I mean, a lot of places have done that. And then the other thing that bothers me, and I don't have any control over this, but street parking in the city of Alexandria is still free. I think that's crazy. And yeah. I, I remember I was talking with in one of the meetings with Tom Shadney. They're talking about putting in uh, garage parking near the metro. And I said, Tom, is is that parking going to be free? And he looked at me, well, yes. And I said, it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. That is a very, 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 very expensive resource. 
is to build parking spaces and parking decks that are hellaciously expensive and we shouldn't give it away. But if you put a price tag on it, people may decide to look for alternatives. So that when you provide these choices, like these little automated buses and things like that, people say, well, I, I will take that because I, I can't park my gas guzzler. But they were doing the replanning in seven corners. If you look at an area of that, I said, most of that is parking. And not only, so, I mean, that's like setting the potato salad on the picnic and you're going to get ants. Of course you will. Yep. So is there, are we really running into a cement wall with this? Is there, because making this happen means you're going to have to change the prices or the cost of using an automobile. And that means if you got free parking, you're going to drive. So or this drive. is gonna Mary drive. Pauline and I can't help but um, point out Ruston Town Center tried to go towards that paid parking and a number of restaurants and businesses went out of business specifically because, you know, myself living directly within the town of Herndon, um, most all of my friends, we re flat out refused to go to Ruston Town Center anymore. Um, so, you know, I think it's a little ironic on this one being that I am that younger generation, um, <laughs> but it is. Um, you know, I guess it depends on all these areas, but that is definitely if you don't live within walking distance of that area, I'm not going to go if I have to pay to park when I could go to something closer to me for free. And the Mosaic District also has free parking. They've got near, you know, nearby garages. Um, you know, it is a destination, but uh, but yes, yes. I mean, there is definitely, I understand paying for parking for Metro because all of the spots that, you know, Vienna Metro is paying, I think that's different, but I think there's a big difference between parking garages targeting Metro customers versus parking garages for businesses. I was yeah. wondering if, if Tom could jump in on that, on Rustin, uh, Mary Pauline, because I had the same reaction. Did they, did they put the free parking back or where, where does it, where did, how did that end up? I can't go into all the details, but I know a lot of it was because Jackson's was the only restaurant that had specifically written into their contract that parking for their customers always had to be free. And so um, what a lot of people basically do, whether this is the way it's supposed to be or not now, is you just go to the Jackson's parking lot and you can go ahead and park in there for free. Yeah, so a few things on that. So um, in terms of minimum parking requirements, there's a great book on that called The High, the High Cost of Free Parking. Because the other day, somebody's paying for it. His name is um, Don Shoop. Shoop. That's right, Shoop. the Shoopster. So uh, it's a great book. It's like a thousand pages, but if you're interested, um, but we are changing our minimum parking requirements. So traditionally, uh, like for retail, it was six per thousand, six parking spaces per thousand square feet. And that has come down a lot to, to about three or four, depending on the parking area. But as part of what we call ZMOD, the modernization of our zoning ordinance, we are lowering parking requirements. So it would be great if this TAC um, could support that effort. Um, we, we've had 80 meetings out with the public, taken a lot of feedback, incorporated that feedback. So that would be a great thing that um, I can let you know, and Tom can let you know, or Calvin, when that um, item is coming up. And I could send to you, I'll make a point, um, I might just to send you guys the ordinance as written now. And if you have questions, you. You, might, you might want to get a presentation from our uh, ZMOT folks. In terms of parking, I don't know that uh, Fairfax is totally ready yet to um, Mary Pauline's point and others that you have to gradually do these things. You, you, you can't just change people's lifestyle overnight. And I think that uh, RTC, they had heard this was gonna be a problem. And they were I think they were getting the message from their colleagues in Boston, San Francisco, and places where that's the norm, you pay. And uh, they weren't getting listened to. And so they learned the hard way. There, there were businesses that went under, but they have now reversed it. Um, I think you pay um, Monday through Friday, nine to five or something. They have an app. There were people who had issues with the app. So they are trying to work it through. They, they realized they went too far. 
And so um, it, it is shifting, but as we do it, we, we have to be mindful of people's lifestyles. We have to be mindful of what the competition is, like Mayor Pauline was saying, that she'll go somewhere else if she has to pay at this place. So we, we can't, you know, uh, shoot ourselves in the foot. We have to be smart about these things. But we also have to realize that when we make it free, we are inducing more driving. So we, we, you just have to think it through and be mindful and ask people, how could we shift? Because one of the biggest complaints we, we get when we go to public meetings is traffic. So we well, have to really have an honest the cost, the cost of putting up parking spaces gets baked oh, yes. into whatever the the merchant or restaurateur is selling. Yep. You're, you're essentially paying for parking one way or the yeah. other. That's you right. pay for it if you put some coins in the slot uh, yep. or you use your card or you're paying for it in the price of your pizza or whatever. But you're going to pay for it. And it's very <laughs> to build oh, and to maintain. Roger, we'd like to uh, move on to some other questions. We've okay. only got uh, officially another ten minutes, although our history has gone a little longer. Won't you know? Won't won't shut this down right on time, but also don't want to drag this out too long. So, um, yeah, another question, perhaps another uh, uh, commissioner, um, Kevin. Yeah, uh, Rachel, did I kind of catch earlier that that maybe you don't own a car when you said a rental car? Oh no. I actually do, but I um, was going out of town. I had to rent a car, but I, I do try and either walk or bike to work, uh, depending on the weather and how I'm feeling. But I, I've been pretty good of late, I must say. So, but okay. we okay. live where I, I, yeah. I was thinking it would be difficult to go check out hot spots and Tyson's and, and Reston with, without a car, especially on the weekends. You know, it's um, true, yeah. One, one other thing, if I could, a uh, little bit of a segue, but I think something to do with staying in place, if I could prevail upon you, uh, just quickly, uh, the Purple Bin uh, Recycling uh, Program, a big success. I attended a webinar, uh, Fairfax County put their first one on, or I think it was their first one on yesterday. Uh, the question that I posted that they didn't get to or didn't see, um, why is it such a difficult concept to put these in the shopping centers, which is where we buy the glass that, you know, we now have to transport somewhere else if we want to recycle? Uh, I don't know if that's under your line of, uh, of on the org chart, but if you could maybe pass that question on, I'd, I'd love to get an answer on it. For sure. I think it's just because we put them in publicly owned places and maybe the private sector uh, doesn't want us putting them on their land, but I can check. I mean, that's, you know, when as kids, that's where we took our Pepsi bottles back to the place where we bought them from. So, I, you know, I don't think it's that foreign of a, con, a concept. Well, maybe yeah. it's time to get back to that. Yeah, if, yeah, if they'll let us use their land. I like that idea. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for, and thanks for the presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Um, Okay. Tom, I know that uh, uh, obviously uh, not a member of the TAC, but uh, you've been very patient to uh, uh, be here through the presentation. I would like to give you an opportunity if you wanted to make any comments or observations to uh, uh, to do so at, the, at this time. Oh, well, thank you, Mike. Um, Tom Bashad, I'm the director of Fairfax County DOT, and um, I think Rachel covered a lot of topics, um, a lot of activity going on around the county. Um, we are we are looking at a version of paid parking, and um, you know we've been studying on street parking. And one of the challenges with on street parking is if you don't make it um, paid parking, you end up pe having people sit there potentially for long periods of time, and the the spots don't turn over. And so we are looking at what that might. Um, what that might entail in uh, the Tyson's area and potentially in Reston. Um, we're not finished with the study yet, but we are preparing to um, to, to uh, provide some information to the board to see where they are with it. But that that would help to implement paid parking in, in some of our commercial areas. Um, not to say that there wouldn't be free parking, but the, the most ideal parking uh, right in front of businesses would um, potentially have a, a, a charge, and we would do that in a way that 
um, you know, have multiple ways for people to pay for it, so they wouldn't necessarily have to have a, a pocket full of quarters or something like that. So we are looking at some of those concepts. Um, one of the uh, one of the nice things about Fairfax County is we have a lot of different types of land use, and so we can try different things in different places, um, as as Rachel alluded to in her presentation. Um, this is Mary Pauline. Um, I have a question. Um, kind of as a comparison to something Virginia Beach had done. When you're looking at doing the paid parking, I, um, and it's not a good thing that I hear this, but I unfortunately know numerous people that um, will choose to drive after drinking because they don't want to pay the charges to leave their car overnight. Um, has there been something looked at where working with restaurants to allow if it's known that you're going to be paying to take an Uber, a taxi, do something so that you're not drinking and driving to encourage them that they don't have to pay to leave their car? Yeah, I think probably what we would have is the type of thing where, you know, in the peak periods, you know, the, during the day, um, you know, there would be a parking charge, but I would be surprised if we would end up charging for, um, you know, kind of off peak hours, um, first of all. but Obviously, drinking and driving is something that we want to discourage and, and um, would be interested in looking at programs to, to discourage that. So, um, you know, we can certainly see what uh, Virginia Beach is doing and see if there's some way that we could uh, look at that if we're if we get to the point where we're implementing paid parking. And it wouldn't be countywide or anything like that. It would really be those premium spaces right in front of businesses. They, and we do um, charge for parking at all of our metro stations, and we'll continue to do that. Of course. Well, um, appreciate that. And, and Tom, I think the study you are referencing, uh, I suspect, is Henry Stein McCartney's, and uh, she's been in our on-deck circle for a while, knowing that they're, uh, uh, the, the study's not quite ready. But that's the one you're talking about, correct, Tom? Yes. Okay. Well, we very much look forward to talking to her when she uh, when she's able to you know come do that, um, you know, because there's obviously a lot of parking issues there. One observation I'll make quickly about the uh, the parking, and it sort of gets a little bit into sort of the way the county has developed. Um, you know, Reston designed a destination, and they acknowledge that you drive to it. Mosaic District has 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 done the same. Um, and so um, part of the transition, I think, is having destinations that you maybe have to drive to to get to. Um, uh, once you are there, um, you know, now you can enjoy the, the fruits of it. And certainly uh, Reston and Mosaic have both uh, uh, made arrangements for uh, people to live there as well. Um, and so uh, I think there's definitely a, a parking control issue, so to speak, there. Um, but there's also an area of, of you know, maybe folks don't have to drive as far to get to uh, to rest in a mosaic because they might have gone to other areas. These are people that are relatively nearby. Um, I'm not going to make any sweeping generalizations here because I, I don't have the expertise that I to do that. But I certainly, it seems to me, is, is part of the, the transition is at least you get folks in a place where they can enjoy the location, encourage folks to uh, to live there. And as Rachel said, you know, in the Mosaic District, perhaps grow it further, uh, you know, to uh, have, uh, you know, more locations that folks want to live and, and play and, and work in the same area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Commissioner Sidney, Pete, I see you've yes, got a question. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, and kind of a comment, really. Um, one, uh, thank you for the presentation, Rachel. Uh, it, Sure. I, I've seen versions of it before, but this this is more inclusive. So thank you. Um, but it came up with uh, near the end uh, where Fairfax needs a complete street policy. Um, yeah. Is Fairfax actually moving towards adopting a policy like that? I mean, maybe that's for you and Tom or either one of you, because uh, I, I would definitely support that complete street policy, and you could use Richmond Highway as a test case. Uh, so. That would be great. Yeah, it's, it's on our to do list and um, Tom could speak uh, more to how, because we have to work with VDOT, how uh, that overlaps. But um, Tom, do you want to listen? Sure. So there are many components of a complete street policy already in the comprehensive plan, but they're not 
um, pulled together in a document called Complete Street Policy. So we are actually working on that. Okay. Um, we have a couple of staff people that are working to pull that together so that there is a, you know, a reference document that everybody can refer to and, and, and use to, to implement some of these concepts in, as, as redevelopment is occurring. That's the other thing that's positive about um, Fairfax is we do have redevelopment occurring. Um, we don't have stagnant um, communities. And so through the redevelopment, we can achieve uh, many of the concepts that uh, we've been di discussing this evening. But yes, we are working on one um, and trying to pull together all the elements uh, to to put it all in one document. Excellent. Th thank you both. That I'd love to see the finished product when when it when and if it ever uh, comes out. So, yeah. or or even um, while it's in the works, maybe Tom, uh, the staffers working on it, could present something to the TAC just to let them know where we are and perhaps get some feedback. That might that might be a to do item for the TAC. <laughs> Sure. When we get to a point where we've got a you know a working draft, we definitely want to socialize it and, and get feedback from from a, variety, a wide variety of audiences. Okay. That, that says Thank to, you. That, to that point, Pete um, and uh, Mike through the chair. Um, <laughs> do, do we? Uh, do you all want to like as things come up? Do you want us to let you know? So uh, there are some committees who write memos to the board and say, here's something we support and we think, you know, we, we should do. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something this committee wants to do? I don't think they have in the past. Maybe they have and I wasn't aware of it. I think we absolutely would like to be uh, made aware of uh, things that are, that are uh, um, as they're evolving, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and certainly recognize that there's sort of uh, policy evolution and then there's near-term opportunities. Um, you know, when I talked to Commissioner uh, Glenn recently, she talked about an interest in, in policy development. I'm going to out you just a little bit, Alexis. Um, you know, and it's certainly something I know we want to look at. But also, um, and this might be something, and, and this is another piece we can look at. There are near-term opportunities. Um, and, uh, you know, Route 1 is potentially a, a, a huge one there. One of the things, one of the lessons I took from the presentation we had recently from the uh, Economic Development Administration was uh, you know the uh, uh, the amount, and we looked at it uh, in the uh, uh, you know along the silver line um, is the incredible opportunity for growth there is there and Rachel you you, know, you touched upon this uh, upon that in your in your presentation so I think it's very important for the TAC to be aware of economic opportunities economic situations along our transportation corridor so we look at that picture uh, together uh, Commissioner Sitnik and I talked about that uh, you know offline a little bit as well too. Um, you know, uh, reached out to uh, Steve Tarditi uh, uh, to try and see how the uh, Route 1 uh, study is going. Yeah. Uh, not quite ready yet, but I assume and hope, you know, pretty soon. I uh, would like to be able to sort of look at these things a little bit holistically um, and perhaps the TAC uh, informed by, uh, you know, a, a new, uh, 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 new views of parking, new views of place. Um, can perhaps weigh in on some uh, some specific things as well. Uh, I don't want to limit us uh, nor broaden us, uh, but certainly the more we know about things, the more opportunity we have to uh, uh, to make informed uh, decisions there. It's a long way of saying yes, we absolutely would like to know kind of what's going on. And what I think we find and what I hope we'll find is that commissioners, particularly those that represent areas where something's happening, like Route 1, but others, um, are going to be more interested, uh, perhaps be able to take a lead for on behalf of the commission to look into some things and help guide the commission itself, the broader commission, in discussions of various things, to try and perhaps make some of those, uh, uh, you know, some of those uh, uh, pronouncements uh, when they're appropriate, uh, uh, both because of what's happening in the local community and the status of things that are happening as the county staff is developing things. So we got our sort of a sweet spot there where the uh, the tax involvement might be able to help uh, um, advance the cause a little bit. And we very much, like, I, 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 I feel comfortable saying that on behalf of the tech, we'd like to be able to do those kind of things, look for those opportunities. Yes. <laughs> Good. Good. So, um, but Alexis, if I could, you know, uh, uh, calling you a little bit there. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I see you, you're on my screen here in the, at home. So um, uh, uh, I've seen you, you know, keenly interested here. Um, you know, what do you think about some of the, the policy development work and stuff like that and, and some of the uh, balancing with near-term things? I'm just, just kind of curious what your thoughts are on, on that matter. 
Uh, well, thanks, uh, Rachel, for the presentation. It was, you know, I had my camera off, but I was quietly applauding through most of it. Um, so thanks for that. I, yeah, you know, uh, Mike is right. There's a lot of um, policy um, issues that I am interested in in the TAC looking at, and I think moving forward, I would I would like to see um, us. Um, addressing those policies and providing our feedback to um, the board of supervisors as appropriate on these issues to help, you know, as I said to Mike, you know, I think we we might be the state of Virginia's biggest customer, VDOT's biggest customer. We're a large county. We provide a lot of funding, and they have a lot of customers here. Um, and then I feel like in some cases we can, you know, maybe use that leverage a little bit to implement some of these. Um, these policies that, that Rachel touched on in her presentation um, and and really rethink how the county has, you know, we kind of came uh, to being in the car era and um, maybe taking a step back and evaluating how, um, you know, maybe just flip that on its head a little bit and look about what's really best for our community and um, instead. Um, I did want to mention, um, the I-495 next project um, tonight. We, we some of Rachel's presentation touched on the Beltway and uh, how it was not envisioned to be what it is now. Um, and right now, VDOT and the county are exploring the possibility of widening it again. Um, and I, I, I'd be interested to hear um, Rachel's perspective, Tom Bashadney's perspective. Um, I, there was a robust discussion by the Board of Supervisors last week at, at the, the BOS Transportation Committee meeting about the pros and cons of doing this, um, about the environmental impacts, about the neighborhood impacts, um, about the lack of transit associated with the widening. And so, um, you know, I think these are the kinds of things that, that moving forward, I think, I hope the TAC can have an, um, a, you know, some interest in and some discussion on and um, and provide some some progressive recommendations. Yeah, I was very uh, heartened to hear the board discussion. I thought that uh, Faust brought up some really good points and really cares yes. about his community and the impact that's going to have. And then uh, Palchik brought up transit and how this absolutely has to have transit. So I, I was very heartened um, with the um, the perspectives they were taking. And admittedly, I don't know as much about that project. Um, and Tom, do you want to talk about it in the letter you're going to be sending and the ma major points you all are bringing up uh, on behalf of the board? Sure. So um, we are preparing um, comments for the board to consider on December 1st. Um, the, the express lanes do provide an option for transit that doesn't exist today. Um, today, if you wanted to run a bus from Tyson's to Bethesda, you the bus would sit in the same traffic that everybody else would, and and you wouldn't you wouldn't have any advantage to taking transit. Um, clearly, there are a lot of trips back and forth across um, the American Legion Bridge between Montgomery County and Fairfax County, and and today, 90 plus percent of them are in in the single occupant auto. Um, there's really no even any incentive to to carpool unless you're family members probably. So the express lanes do provide an opportunity for transit if um, there is a uh, ability to actually fund the buses and, and operate the service. And so that was a very important point that the board made, and and so that will be a, a principal point that uh, is included in the letter. Um, there is no question that the 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 project that VDOT has outlined so far still is needs work. Um, there are still significant environmental aspects that need to be mitigated, and um, there are there are positive things. I mean, they they're going to put a trail along the Beltway and and set it up to connect um, across across uh, the the American Legion Bridge when Maryland widens it, which is something that you know there was no hope for um, up until this point. So um, pedestrians right now don't even have an option to, to walk to Maryland if they if they even if they wanted to. So um, you know I th I think that there are are some positive things about the project. There are definitely things that still need work. Um, stormwater management. Uh, they need to tighten up the um, the right of way so that they can reduce the impact on trees and the environment. 
um, they need to make sure that uh, they are protecting the the residential neighborhoods along the um, along the project. So um, the the comments to the board will be comprehensive. There there's a whole um, uh, document uh, with very detailed comments that will be going to the board. Uh, so, are you, Tom, are you at liberty to send the draft to the TAC, or at what point can they see what you've written? Or uh, whatever. It'll go to the board right before Thanksgiving. At that point, it'll be a public document that we can share. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, the the presentation is available on the website. Um, the the presentation that we gave to the board transportation committee. So that that is available. We can Calvin, Calvin can send the link to the committee. Um, so that information is available. Yes, it was a, a, a much conversation during the uh, board transportation committee meeting. Um, and as Rachel points out, and I was watching particularly keenly with um, uh, my supervisor um, having concerns about it. Um, yes, it's uh, uh, still much work to be done, but uh, uh, and, and some of it, of course, is as simple as, you know, when's Maryland going to move? You know, how long is that going to take for them? Because uh, there's no guarantees they can they can do their other side. They're, they're part of it, although finally they are talking about it. Yeah, I mean, I didn't realize these ramps. Um, you know, when I saw the presentation, I was like, "Holy cow! Is this going to be another mixing bowl?" And I think Faust is having real real issues with that, rightly so. Like, what what will this look like? It's a gateway to Tyson's. Um, you know, let's 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 really think this through carefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you? you know, one, oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Oh, I was just going to say. Well, uh, time to finish up. Uh, we very much appreciate, and we'll work with Calvin to get a copy of the letter once it's prepared and, and sent. And look forward to sharing that with the uh, uh, with the TAC here. Um, you know, but uh, I was just going to make an observation that uh, one of the um, advantages, so to speak, of running out of money is you're forced to be more thoughtful. That, you know, Rachel, you talked about that obviously in your presentation. But also, I think to a degree here, we've, I'll say it this way, you know, uh, um, we kind of have built the big streets we can. And I don't just mean financially, I mean, we're, we're, we're uh, you know, uh, widening 66. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, HOV lanes and things like that, the smart lanes and stuff like that. So um, I'd be hard pressed, even as uh, somebody who, yes, drives a car myself, I'd be hard pressed to identify a big place we, we, we haven't finished yet. So um, I think that the criteria now, uh, uh, we, uh, got the low hanging fruit, whatever the case may be. Um, so there's that's another thing where I think we might be in a stage where um, as we look to do different things in different parts of the county, um, you know, uh, uh, some of the obvious transportation only projects have already been done. Now it's time to sort of roll things back a little bit. And, and uh, uh, I think we can look at particular places to do that. Um, Rachel's given us a good example just tonight, um, but there'll be others as well. And I think that'll be something that'll be very helpful for the TAC to um, be aware of and, and maybe provide advice on is where do we start? Where do we go next? Uh, where are these places that, that make the most sense? So Rachel, we know you've got ideas on that. We very much want to hear that. There, the FC dot spends a lot of time, a huge amount of time thinking about this. Um, and so I think it behooves us to uh, uh, spend a, um, a, a, a similar amount of time and intellectual energy to make sure that we're giving it the same kind of thought that our deputy county exec and, and FC dot uh, uh, director and staff is already doing. Yeah, as as particular uh, specific projects come up, um, we can um, keep you advised. Like the one that Jeremy mentioned with Route Seven, I think that um, you know if, if if there are alter alternatives to really focus on the pedestrian cyclist rather than just widen the road that that would be great for him to hear that from the tack mm -hmm. i think that's why, why you guys exist i don't know what if you have, what if you have thoughts about that on specific projects mm -hmm. you know and, and part of what we um have been looking here the past couple of years uh, as we look at some of the future stuff um we got a bit away from although we did still look at individual projects and offer our our assessments here um, I think that uh, uh, we are now in a better position, uh, and, and not and partly because of the futures activity, although not not in large part by any stretch. Uh, you know, the new members of the tax, some of the perspectives they bring, the fact that the situation has changed, allows us to bring sort of more of a future view on things. 
um, uh, and 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 also to sort of try and balance this because as Rachel, if you also acknowledge, you know, we have to be mindful of the past and the transition and all that, and we have to do that as well too. So I like the fact that that we have to throw all things into the mix. The new things we'd like to do, the old things we're having to live with, uh, the timing, the funding, you know, the funding, all those kind of things. Uh, that's what makes, I'll say, this way, that's what makes policy fun <laughs> is to try and balance all these kind of things and, and look forward to try and be in a great place for having some of those conversations to complement the conversations and discussions that are happening with the Board of Supervisors, with FCDOT, and, and inside our, uh, our, our communities in you know, Fairfax and other places. Yep. Okay. Um, it is a little after 9.30. Um, so we're only 10 minutes about, uh, later than we, than we planned, which actually is not too bad. Um, I would like to uh, g uh, give uh, commissioners one last chance to ask any uh, pressing questions right now before we moved on. Um, uh, but uh, so I'm looking at names. I see a hand up from Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. Okay. Um, just before Rachel uh, leaves and uh, jumping ahead to future presentations, I just wanted to bring up again uh, my desire uh, to get the Uber and Lyft people in here. And if if Calvin's having any problem with getting them engaged, then maybe something that's uh, Rachel could lend her uh, her weight to. Yeah, I could do that. Who who do you want to hear from? Kind of a big company. <laughs> Uh, well, we're hoping to get at least uh, Uber uh, and and Lyft, and uh, I think was there a third one on there. Well, I will just say um, that uh, one of our commissioners actually uh, uh, works with those uh, those companies as in a representational uh, capacity there. Um, so we always welcome the help of, the, of Rachel's help. But uh, David Skiles also has some uh, uh, connections there as well too. And I think, and it is definitely something that we want to we, we want to look at uh, look at doing. So I won't put David on the spot right away, although I'll, I definitely I think it's appropriate for me to point out his his connection there. Um, yes, that is one of the uh, definitely one of those those groups you want to have uh, uh, talk to us, um, and perhaps with uh, you know some of the uh, uh, electric transportation companies as well too. You know uh, some of the uh, uh, scooter companies. So, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Tom. So I think you have that on your list for future meetings, and I know, we do. Um, you know, we're working to coordinate those meetings as they come up. So um, I think we're, you know, we have ways to to work through that. So when when the time comes that you want to, you know, put that on the agenda, we can work through that and get the okay. representatives of both companies to to come speak with you. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I would just say, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to see it move up on the list uh, rather than down, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Well, that is one of the topics for uh, you know our working uh, our working portion here at the end, uh, because we do need to identify a topic for uh, uh, for December, and that could very well be a candidate. It certainly could be a candidate if we want to if we want to do that. So, um, Mr. Chair, to, uh, to um, Kevin's point, so Kevin, what aspect of um, Uber or Lyft did you want to hear? Because we've had meetings with them to look at them providing uh, services for the public, like, um, you know, our communities in need, that kind of thing. But are you talking about just the bigger picture of where they're going in general? Or what aspect would you like to know more about? Are you there? Kevin, I'll, I'll let you start there. Oh, I'm, I see a little yellow triangle on Kevin's. I don't know if he's lost his bandwidth. Uh, Rick, Kevin, can you hear us? So okay. If you could find that out, Mike, then. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, okay. Okay. We'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, we, we know that when we want to. Uh, Invite somebody to come talk. We need to be a little bit specific about what we'd like to like to talk about. So, absolutely. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um. Any other uh, questions for uh, Rachel regarding her uh, presentation uh, this evening? Okay. Well. Again, Rachel, very much appreciate you uh, uh, coming and joining us this evening. 
one thing I did want to uh, mention that we, you know, I talked about a little bit, but uh, also for the commissioners while you're here, um, we're planning on having a, a facilitated work session again, the one that Tom has been gracious enough to uh, to offer to sponsor for us, um, aka an offsite. Um, would love to have you come and talk to us uh, uh, during that session. Uh, we don't need to do the historical two to four now because we've got the background, but certainly to to help us think about important things to uh, to, to focus on. Um, and so yeah. we'll obviously keep you posted on how that okay. develops, and that's an invitation for you to come join us, please, when we when we have that discussion. Yep. Happy to help. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, well, um, all people are welcome to stay for all of the TAC meetings. It is a public meeting. I will point out that uh, uh, Tom and uh, uh, Rachel have, have graced us with a presence for a, um, a good portion of the evening. As you can look at the agenda, it's sort of internal TAC business from here on. Again, you're welcome to stay, but this is also an opportunity for you to drop off if you, if you choose to do so. Um, Rachel, Tom, thank you so much for uh, uh, participating. Uh, uh, any last comments you'd like to make before you uh, uh, wave goodbye, if for in fact that's what you'd like to do to take advantage here to go maybe have a, a drink or some food? Sure, I'd love to go drinking. Um, <laughs> thank you all. I'll buy you the first one. <laughs> um, no, really, thanks for your uh, commitment to serving on uh, this committee. It's just so important, and I really appreciate any citizen who will you know, take take precious time to weigh in on these important matters. And we'll, we'll be following up with you. We'll need you. We, we can't do these things alone. We need citizens like you. Thank, Thank you. Thanks much. for your feedback and questions. They were really good. Oh, now that we have, is that you, Kevin? Yes, I, uh, my laptop lasted in the last meeting, but this time it didn't. So I had to go run and grab a power cord. Oh, 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 so I I dropped off at the end of my uh, uh, my Uber uh, uh, request, but I think you responded positively to it. I did. I, I just had a question because they have different divisions, and like we're talking to a division that can provide Uber rides for uh, people in need, um, kind of like paratransit. But what were you thinking, just in general? So I can in, get ge in general, but yes, but to include paratransit, that's an important component. Uh, you know, how they would supplement that uh, as well. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll work on that. Well, I'll tell you what, Rachel, if we could, um, we'll talk about this here um, uh, in our work session. Uh, what I'd like to be able to do is uh, when we reach out to you, have a, um, a better sense of what the TAC would like to focus on. I think Kevin's got a good start for that for that conversation. Um, sure. But we'll, uh, we'll, 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 come organized and say, we'd like to ask them to please talk about this. And obviously, Tom, I heard you loud and clear that you also have connections there and that uh, we want to work through FC dot uh, as well uh, to certainly yeah. make sure that uh, uh, as we reach out there. Yeah, we would just get your names if that's what you need. Yeah. Cool. All right, have a good evening. Thank you all. Sorry I kept you up so late. Yeah. Bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Great presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Tom, do you have any last comments you'd like to make, or do you're welcome to stick around with us if you if you'd like? Uh, just thanks for having us. Thanks for your feedback tonight, and uh, we'll work with Calvin to uh, set up your, um, you know, uh, presentations and and guests for future meetings. Um, we're here to help with that. We well, appreciate. So that. have a good night, everyone. Well, thank you, Tom. Tom, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thanks for us to everyone. Uh, the next item on the agenda, if there is any members of the public here who have been uh, uh, lurking, uh, 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 you know, in the, the time of the line, um, please do let us know if you'd like to speak for a couple minutes. You're welcome to. Okay, hearing nothing, I will presume that's because we have no members of the public who have stuck this out for the last two hours and ten minutes. <laughs> So, um, on to other business and announcements. Just a, just a few things here. Um, wanted to uh, uh, we we talked a little bit about the uh, the board transportation committee meeting uh, from uh, uh, last week. Um, uh, I am planning, as I've mentioned before, uh, have Mary Pauline and I reach out and uh, uh, to uh, Chairman Alcorn 
to uh, talk to him, uh, talk about about some of the things the TAC is looking to do. Talk talk to him about our uh, our, our bylaws. Um, right now, we are tentatively on the agenda for the March second board transportation committee meeting. The uh, sort of uh, uh, shadow conversation, whatever uh, we've talked about the uh, interest planning uh, committee in the past. Um, that's kind of a placeholder on the agenda, but really uh, would rather talk about uh, sort of the future of the TAC, which really I think our, our futures activity, so to speak, is kind of getting merged a little bit. We're looking to the future on all our things and trying to bring these things together. So we'll have a chance to talk about that. It's that that March 2nd date is certainly not cast in stone. Um, to tell you the truth, I would like to uh, uh, maybe do something after we have an offsite. We'll talk about that in, in just a little bit here about some of the timing there. But I did want to mention that we uh, um, we have been invited to uh, speak there, and 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 we will go in at at some point. Um, the uh, another thing I'll mention is that I had a, a, a good conversation. Speaking of a place and things like that, with uh, uh, Sonia Brihi, the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Um, Alexis, Jeremy, I, I know that you know her, and and she mentioned that she knows you, and so it was a good a good intro conversation there. Um, at some point, I'd probably like to have her come in and speak. Um, same time too, we can also, you know, have her be part of some of our other conversations. This starts to get into a little bit about how we organize our, our activities. Um, if we sort of have everybody we know come in one at a time to talk, uh, that would take a lot of time and, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to do quite as much. I'd like to, you know, maybe try and have a, a few groups come together to talk about topics. That's kind of a thing I want to talk about on the offside a little bit about how we organize ourselves a little bit, but I at least wanted to mention that she and I had had a, had a conversation. Um, for the uh, moving on the agenda for the December uh, TAC meeting, there were uh, uh, two primary uh, uh, candidates, perhaps a third with uh, Uber and Lyft now, um, and we've got other items on the uh, list as well too. The first was reviewing the results of the uh, Richmond Highway EDA analysis. Uh, would still like to do that. Uh, don't know if that's going to be uh, available. Um, I think particularly with uh, um, potential discussions about the Route 1 corridor, we'd like to have that in our in our hip pocket. Um, but I can't say for sure now that, that we'd be able to do that. The other uh, um, topic, and you heard the conversation there with Tom and I about uh, the Henry Stein McCartney curbside management study. Um, uh, that was the other thing we've been trying to do for a little while. The reason we haven't is because uh, 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 Henry's report is not quite done yet, uh, and the way FCDOT wants to handle it is to go to the Board of Supervisors first. Um, I think uh, n normally, notionally, uh, in, in sort of regular order, it'd be nice to have the tax season things first, but we are certainly not somebody who uh, has to approve something before FCDOT takes something to the Board. So, of course, if FCDOT wants to take something to the board, we defer to them and, and of course, <laughs> allow them to work through their chain of command. Um, so, we're going to wait in, in, in this case here. Uh, in other activities, uh, certainly things have to be far enough along and worthy of talking about. And Tom alluded to that with some of the activities with the uh, 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 some of the transit uh, express lane project and things like that. So, we'll we'll find our sea legs as we go forward there. But but, but as, of, as of right now, uh, we don't know that we could have either of those topics on the uh, December agenda. Um, we could perhaps reach out to uh, uh, Uber and have a conversation with them. Um, I would actually, as, as, we, as we talk about that, um, uh, call upon uh, David a little bit um, uh, and ask if you've got any uh, you know thoughts or uh, uh, suggestions of uh, way, uh, places to focus in with an Uber and Lyft conversation. If there's any timing things you're aware of that might cause us to want to do something sooner rather than later, or later rather than sooner, so to speak, although not too much later. Um, David, do you uh, have any comments there uh, on, on that, perhaps? Okay. Um, or perhaps, let's see, David might have had to uh, uh, drop off there, um, but uh, um, I'm trying to think now because there was another aspect. I'm, I, I'd have to check my notes and see um, about uh, um, another uh, uh, group that might want to bring um, uh, to sort of complement the Uber and Lyft uh, uh, conversation. Um, but certainly, this is something we can, that we can pursue. Um, how do other commissioners feel? We've got some other topics there. We can always 
sort of talk about our future planning, but I don't want to just keep doing that all the time. <laughs> I'd like to have new things come in and give us things to chew on. Uh, Rachel actually gave us a couple of uh, good ideas here, uh, uh, you know, just uh, just this evening um, that we can consider as, as well. Um, but let me just throw it open for commissioners. Are there any uh, topics in particular? Uh, Kevin, you suggested Uber and Lyft. Any others uh, have some topics you think would be worthy of consideration here in our December meeting? Mike, Via, Via was, the, I don't know if you were trying to think of that, but Via is the third one um, on yeah, okay, the sun. Okay, thanks. Uh, there was, I think there was some other, uh, 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 some other group. I've got some notes somewhere, I'm sorry. And I'll, I will, you know, give that to the other, to the commissioners as well. Um, uh, uh, you know, that, that might make a complimentary conversation with, uh, with uh, Uber, Lyft and Via. I wish I could remember it, but I'm just blanking on it now. It's the Alzheimer's kicking in again. I apologize. Well, one of the things about Via is I'm not sure that they have service this far out in Fairfax County. I've used them uh, okay. primarily in Arlington and D.C. That doesn't mean you can't talk to them, but I'm not. It's probably good to talk to because they're local folks. But uh, I'm not sure they have much service out here. Okay, well, that's good. Could be. Okay. Um, any other topics occur to commissioners? I'd like to raise it here for for the December meeting. Uh, it's not your only chance to raise it, but I'll I'll give you the opportunity now. Yeah, it's Jeremy. Sure. I um, yes. just want to second uh, having. Sonia or, or other folks, and I think it's important that we hear from community organizations that are working on these issues because I think it's really informative. People who mm -hmm. are like seeing the barriers that they face and trying to make improvements, um, because I, you know, as we get into policy and other issues, it's mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's a well-rounded um, discussion, not just hearing from FC DOT or hearing from transportation partners, but hearing from folks that are working in the community on these issues. I agree. I think that's a, I think that's a great idea. Um, and having a, uh, let's put this with sort of the right folks at the table for the topic that we want to talk about. Um, and so uh, as we pick up these topics, I think one of our things left to balance is sort of how much we try and bite off. Um, obviously, we're not going to have sort of a county-wide big transportation uh, discussion where everybody's there. You know, we pick certain areas. Um, 495 next could be certainly is one of them. Certainly, some are going to be watching. Alexis, I know you know you raised that issue with me before. Um, I'll put you on the spot again. Sorry. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts right now about how you think the tax should handle 495 next with all the stuff that's going on? Um. Well. I don't know if the TAC can do anything um, in the immediate comment deadline that's coming up on December 4th. That's coming up pretty quick. Um, perhaps individual TAC members might have an opportunity to look at the materials and, you know, form their own opinion and send those comments in. That's that's certainly an option in the short term. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, at this point, I think it's just something to watch and be aware of. Um, Especially given that there the, there's some tentativeness on the board of supervisors to just move ahead with it. Um, yeah. And and it, and it's a you know it's a tricky it's a tricky issue. Um, you know it has it does have the benefit of the trail that that Tom Pashadney mentioned, and I certainly support the opportunity to have a new trail um, put in, but at at the cost of a, a huge um, highway widening. I'm not sure if that's a a trade off that. Uh -huh. you know, is, is, um, is worth it. So, yeah. um, it, just the sorts of things to be conservative, even though that particular widening doesn't directly affect my, my community, you know, it's, it's, it really impacts Fairfax County, um, at large, I think. So I think that's, those are the sorts of things that the TAC, I think ha very much have an appropriate place to, uh -huh. to comment on, um, as a broader, um, board that represents the whole county, not just a, neighbor, a neighborhood or um, a particular type of transportation. Oh, well, very, very true. I have to be, uh, um, you know, honest here, um, uh, being the Drainsville representative to the TAC and having the Drainsville supervisor um, having a, a strong views on the matter. Obviously, of course, I'm going to defer to, to his views on these, but it sort of points out a situation that uh, um, when uh, uh, Supervisor Faust appointed me to the position, 
um, you know, his marching orders basically were, you know, I'll take care of the projects, you take care of sort of the policy stuff and things like that. Now, some of these overlap a little bit. Um, and of course, we'll all be respectful of all supervisors, particularly the ones that appointed us. Um, but it certainly shows, it reminds us and reminds me that uh, um, we want to be uh, cautious of those internal things too, and that we don't do something that takes away from things the supervisors are doing and all that. And then, you know, the choir, I know, I know we recognize that. Um, but I think that's one of the uh, one of the factors there. Certainly, um, you know, I agree, Alexis. I think it's a little it's a little too quick for us to turn on the fastball to have TAP comments in by December. And I think it's something that, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, and not just the timing. Although the timing is a big part of it. Let, let's watch this. Let's see what happens. Um, and let's look at the, look at what happens. This could be one of these those last big road projects that Fairfax needs to do. Um, I use that word gently because I guess maybe you don't necessarily need to do anything, um, but certainly this is a uh, uh, potentially big connector. If Maryland can get their, uh, you know, HOV lanes and things like that to have the, you know, the kind of connection with uh, Montgomery County that we you know, long desired, um, you know, so yes, let, let's watch it, but I, but I don't think it's something that we you know, need to put on our agenda right away. I don't think it's necessarily appropriate for us right away. Mike, I, I, I would agree with that, but I, I, I had thought uh, our side was was generally in favor of this. I didn't was not aware of uh, Supervisor Faust. Is it outright opposition, or is he just he wants to make sure we check off a few things before we we throw our support behind it? Well, um, I want to be careful characterizing you know John's position because I'm not speaking for him. But just watching the, uh, the board transportation committee meeting. Um, you know, he understands the importance, uh, but certainly um, he's not sure that it's necessary to go to do right away. Um, one of the questions they asked, understandably, and I was alluding to it just a moment ago about uh, Montgomery County, is the state of Maryland ready to go? Um, there are people in Maryland uh, who, understandably, um, you know, look at the COVID situation and say, well, you know, people aren't going to be driving anymore, so we don't need these roads. <laughs> That may yeah. be the case to a degree. It's certainly difficult to incorporate that in your in your traffic plans and things like that. So now there, now there, there's significant opposition over there. And I mean, I see yeah. the emails uh, from the group that's proposing the, the expansion over there, but there is a lot of opposition in Maryland on it. So, um, you know, there, that that has to be dealt with as well. Oh, absolutely. And there has been for a while. And, and you know, yet here we have the, the governor wanting to go forward with it. Now, the governor, you know, is not a king, uh, can't just make things happen. Um, but uh, he obviously felt uh, strong enough about the project and secure enough in his footing to be able to at least go this far forward. Um, but, but, but yes, it is a big unknown. And, and uh, uh, certainly the COVID situation uh, has strengthened, you know, the arguments of those in Maryland who say we don't need to, you know, that, that wider route at all. So I think I think where Supervisor Faust is coming from is that before we rip up the whole area, um, you know, uh, 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 and, and sort of have the uh, the ending of the uh, the HOV lanes right at Georgetown Pike, right at the, the uh, you know the, the border there. Let's see what Maryland does. And the question he asked at the end was, Avita, and this was certainly supported by uh, Chairman McKay, what's the impact of a delay? Um, VDOT, not surprisingly, was not prepared to answer that question on the spot. They're going to get back to and, and answer those kind of questions. So I think that at this point, they certainly want to uh, look at how, you know, how big a deal it is if we don't do it right away. Was, was there actually an option that we would do this without Maryland's participation? We would just extend it a mile and stop? You know, I, I, I can't remember, uh, you know, each slide in the, in, in, the, in the presentation now. The expectation is that Maryland goes forward. Um, and I think that the, uh, the concern is that if Maryland doesn't, that's what you'll end up with, is you've extended your, your hot lanes three miles. Um, and so, you know, you just, you just changed the endpoint. Um, a lot easier to merge traffic three miles further from the border than right at the American Legion Bridge. Um, you know, but uh, 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 but I think that's, and I'm 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 projecting here a little bit that that's part of the the question that uh, Supervisor Faust is asking is that so what hap what you know what happens if Maryland doesn't do it and does that maybe mean that we we you know should wait and see? 
And I just would finally would add that the I, I, I didn't want to bring it up during Rachel's. I bring it up every meeting, but uh, I mean the COVID uh, impact on on smart streets, livable streets, the impact on Metro. Look at what Metro is going through right now in their budget. Uh, it you know it, it, one side of me says we could all just you know stay home for six months, skip six months of meetings to see what the impact of COVID is uh, going to be on transportation. It's going to be on the revenue stream coming from uh, uh, our office buildings when people when they find they don't have to go in the office anymore. So there's there's it's not just the um, the expansion of the of the. 495 in the Maryland. It's, it's so many other things that I think COVID's going to have an impact on. Well, not to get into the topic, but you remember, you know, the telework TDM conversation we had a couple a couple months ago, right on that right on that point uh, about uh, the fact that if you uh, work remotely, it will affect. We hope it affects the amount of traffic on the road. We're hoping that it cuts down the amount of cars. Um, but yes, we'll see. But it, it, if there's no, uh, it, everything has a, a trade off because it, 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 yeah, that is a very noble thing to have more teleworking. There's a lot of advantages to it. But our revenue stream is heavily dependent on commercial office space. Uh, so if that, uh, you know, if that takes a hit, uh, we'll have to deal with that. True. But also, I will say that uh, um, the, uh, uh, when you looked at the amount of traffic, uh, I use the uh, the uh, the uh, measure when Pope John Paul came to Washington in 2006. Uh, the streets were empty, but there was really only about a five percent cut in traffic uh, because it was spread out, and uh, uh, you know people were not on the road at the same time. You don't need to have traffic go to zero to have this kind of effect. All you need is 10 or 20 percent teleworking one day a week. Um, yes, it will affect uh, your office space needs. Um, but I don't think anybody expects us to you know, not go into the office at all. Um, which makes it a little harder because now you do want some traffic, but not too much. How do you do that? That's hard. You sure, Those you sure that we can you, you, consider? You sure that wasn't one of his miracles that pushed him into sainthood? <laughs> that might have been. That might have been. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I tell you what, for the December meeting, we still have three. Uh, three candidates. Um, there are some uh, some other uh, topics on the list we might be able to pull up or something like that as well. So if any commissioner uh, has any thoughts yeah. uh, later about uh, uh, things, that, uh, um, things that they'd like to uh, perhaps talk about in the December meeting, please let me know. Um, related but not directly related was the annual TAC holiday event. Um, in the past, we had uh, you know had half a meeting that turned into a uh, turned into a um, uh, we actually uh, uh, talked to the county attorney. Tom uh, contacted uh, one of them on our behalf about having um, events that are not uh, 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 work related. And, uh, stepping back, we have a pandemic going on right now. So it's probably not a good idea for us to try and get together uh, in person for either a meeting or a social event in December, much as I'm sure we would love to get together. Um, and have a drink or, or something like that. And, and I would like to do that at some point. Um, but I think it's just very difficult to imagine doing an effective holiday event unless we try to do, you know, something like this, have a drink or something like that. And to tell you the truth, I would probably rather do something in conjunction with uh, uh, an offsite that maybe we have in, you know, the late winter, early spring or something like that, where we uh, perhaps try and get together in a socially distanced manner um, if folks are comfortable to have our planning session. And after that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's to do outside somewhere. So it's a long way of saying, I, I think we should probably uh, give up on the idea of, of, of having a holiday event. At the same time too, I'm not adverse certainly to doing it or entertaining some ideas of if commissioners have it. Um, Mary Pauline, I'm gonna call on you a little bit here because uh, I, I know you've, uh, you've discussed in the past a frustration, understandable. I think we we all shared it about the uh, you know the current structure we've uh, you know the previous structure we've had for these events. Um, any thoughts on you know trying to have some kind of social event in December or just just wait and, and try and do something later? Why don't we have a social event next June? We could we could meet outside, and I suspect by next June 
we'll probably have a, a good many of us who have been vaccinated. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what it appears. I mean, we've got two of them now, and there'll probably be two or three more by the end of the year. I don't know how quickly we're all going to get our jabs, but I um I feel like this is one of those situations where there's no need to make a decision until we have to. And I definitely like the idea of doing something in the future, but until we actually have a better sense of things improving, I don't think we necessarily should put a specific date to something in person. I second that. I agree with that. Um, my uh, a company that I'm working with just recently had an offsite. Um, actually, our, our team here on the East Coast and the team on the West Coast did, and we here went to Bull Run Winery and were able to, you know, have a lunch, like two of us at a table. Um, you know, the team on the West Coast did the same thing, went to a restaurant, got a big table for a small group. You know, everybody was outside in both events. So, you know, come spring, summertime, I'd be amenable to doing something like that, something outside socially distanced, you know, at a, one of our cool Fairfax County, you know, facilities that we have. Well, actually, with mention Bull Run Winery, I've been there recently, and Paradise Springs, which I think is right near you. The winery is a great place to go, um, socially distanced when it's warm enough so you don't sit there freezing. Yeah, Paradise Springs is even closer to me. I'm not going to complain about that, Mike. There you go. No, I would agree. Uh, but are, are we going to catch 22? Are we even in June? And we uh, and I agree we shouldn't be meeting. December's out. But mm -hmm. are we allowed to meet socially in, in June? Can we What's do that? Matter? Well, you know, I can uh, I can share the uh, actually uh, um, uh, work with Calvin to to to, to share this, um, although it's not strictly necessary to do so. Tom had asked again on, on our behalf, the county attorney, and I asked specifically, um, can we get together, um, uh, you know, informally uh, without an agenda when we're not talking business? And the, the short answer is yes, we can. Although of course the lawyer's response is a little longer than that, um, you know, uh, but. We would have to not talk business. It's not a uh, 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 a faint move to pretend we're not going to talk business and then to get together and talk business. If we do this, if we have a social event, then we are obligated not to talk about transportation. Um, and so I think we can do that. <laughs> um, one of the advantages to doing it after uh, um, in conjunction with uh, with an offsite, perhaps if the offsite is done when the weather's warm enough. Um, is that we should be talked out by them. <laughs> we should be ready to, you know, have a drink and talk about uh, wives, girlfriends, husbands, boyfriends, dogs, uh, kids, uh, um, cousins, whatever the case may be. Um, the new president, if we have one by then, um, whatever we want to, whatever we want to talk about. Um, but uh, you know, we, we we can do it, but we also need to be mindful of the fact that uh, you know, we don't want to, uh, uh, you know, send a uh, uh, a wrong impression. That we aren't being respectful of the uh, of the FOIA rules and, and things like that. Okay, that's you know, let's plan it in June. That would be my vote. Okay. But uh, I mean, I okay. think keeping it on as a potential plan makes sense. I just don't know to pick the exact month yet, um, since we really don't know yeah. how things are going to go. Well, no, you we, don't. Can always, we can always revisit that. I mean, it gets to be yeah. March and April and said, we won't do it in June. It's not ready yet. Or yes, we can do it. I mean, we can revisit this every month. We have to, I mean, looking at the map tonight, it looks pretty bad, but I don't I'm, think anybody wants to know what it's going to look like by next spring. Yeah. I mean, with the weather situation, you know, if you do it in March, maybe you find a good time. You do it on sort of short notice. April, by then, you're starting to be pretty confident you're going to be able to get some good weather. May, June, yes. You know, you're you're pretty sure at that point. Um, so certainly, I don't think we'd even consider doing it before March. Um, and that's the absolute earliest. And, and one of the reasons I want to sort of keep that alive, and let me ask this question. If we, you know, and, and this sort of is moving on, uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, and we'll come back to the TAC award. You know, the work, the work plan for these development facility to work recession. Uh, Mary Pauline and I haven't sat down and had a long conversation. We need to put some agenda items together for that. But one uh, thing I'm thinking about that I wanted to mention here is, you know, maybe on a 
Saturday for you know, two, three hours or something like that. I uh, would like to have, um, you know, maybe Walter Alcorn come and talk to us, uh, Rachel for a little bit, um, you know, Tom Basadne, um, and of course, uh, uh, Dale Castillo from who did the uh, uh, did the great work in the team was with, with Relay. So don't want it to be too long, um, but, you know, I want to have a chance for us to sort of uh, uh, you know, talk to each other and think through things and, and put a, you know, put a work plan together. Um, that could be a, you know, a, you know, a half day sort of thing and all day sort of thing. I'm, I'm trying to get, you know, take your temperature and, uh, about what you're, you know, what you're thinking there. Um, it'd be dedicating some time. Um, but the you know, the word would be, we'd be able to, you know, make some progress on some things and, and perhaps at the end of that, go out and, you know, have some socially distanced food and drink or something like that. So I don't know if that's, if that's something that interests folks. Well, I, I would vote or encourage, there's not really a vote, but I would encourage an earlier work session, uh, even if that means it's before a, a social activity. Uh, you know, I think we need to figure out the, like, maybe a longer term schedule, because otherwise we, I think we're just going to end up in this situation of like, what are we going to do next month? And it's mm -hmm. hard to be, to provide advice or be responsive to the kind of the issues that are going on when we're, you know, just kind of figuring it out. So I, th I think if we can get together and figure out a, a longer term work plan, it would be helpful. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Well, remember that I'm on... we're, we're allowed to meet twice a month and we used to have some work sessions. We, we might want to go back to those for a while, at least in the dead of winter with as much disease around. But uh, so we do have that authority to do that. Certainly is. Um, was I thought I sent another commissioner's going to? Okay. Um, yes, Jeremy, I agree completely. We do need to do that sooner rather than later. Uh, my thought was to. Um, do some homework now to prepare for a focused work session. We were able to, um, you know, get into sufficient depth on issues that were able to uh, make an informed decision about where we'd like to focus our efforts. And that's what I'd like to then take to the board transportation committee, and eventually the board of supervisors to say, you know, this is our, this is our work plan. So the latest I want to do that is March and certainly uh, don't object to doing it, uh, you, know, um, you know, earlier. I think February uh, is probably about the earliest we could do because it's already November. You know, it's going to be a little tough to uh, do too much work on that between now and the holidays. Um, although uh, I can also, uh, you know, make a general challenge to the commissioners. Um, please feel free to write something up, a half page, a couple paragraphs. We've talked about this before, and, and a number of you have been gracious enough to send something already um, previously about things to focus on, things like that. Um, but anything, you know, either, you know, an approach to working, topics you think we should do, uh, things like that, uh, you know, send them to, send them to me, uh, uh, and, and we'll start putting together a paper. What I like to be able to do when we have our offsite is I like to have something that we can send out as a read ahead that folks will be able to look at to get our minds around what I think we're going to focus our efforts on to, to kick off the conversation. So we start from a, from a common, common perspective there. So it's, I think it's uh, my obligation, uh, my responsibility as, as the chair to you know, make sure that gets put together. Uh, I'm going to uh, you know, try and uh, uh, bug Mary Pauline a little bit for that, <laughs> to help with that. But it's also all of our responsibility too. So please feel free to give me stuff. If you don't, we'll still come up with something. Um, but it would help jump started and, and uh, um, just by throwing some, some thoughts on paper, um, you know, that'll help uh, you know, kickstart the, uh, you know, the process of putting something together. Okay, um, the uh, uh, last topic that I have sort of uh, uh, in uh, other business here is the TAC Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, I mean, start with the, the TAC Award. When we talked about this uh, uh, last meeting, uh, there seemed to be a, 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 a wide informal consensus to bestow the 2020 uh, uh, TAC Award to the relay team. Um, uh, you know, in the past, we've had committees that have uh, that have done some work there and and, and solicited uh, 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 recommendations. I think in this case, as we talked about, the uh, you know, the choice is, is clear. 
Um, I'd like to open that for discussion. And if we still believe that that is an appropriate course of action, um, then I'd be, I'd certainly be op uh, uh, open to welcoming a motion to, uh, to designate the relay team as the, as the TAC winner. But let's talk first before, uh, because we might not want to do a motion, Pete. Okay, I, I was just going to make the motion that we that we do that. So we don't want motion yet. So uh, I'll wait. I'd be ready to second that motion. <laughs> I don't think we. And you can open it to discussion. I tell you what, let's discuss the let's discuss motion then. Pete Sitt, Commissioner Sitnik has made the motion, seconded by uh, uh, Commissioner Moores, to uh, uh, bestow the 2020 TAC award on the uh, uh, relay team. Um, discussion on the motion. <coughs> I have no objections. Stand <laughs> here. I'm all right with it. Okay. Yeah. Well, if there's no further discussion on the motion, um, I call for the uh, uh, yeas and nays. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Okay. Um, the uh, the ayes have it by unanimous vote. Vo voice vote. The uh, winner of the 2020 TAC Road TAC Award is uh, the Relay Team. Yay. Hey. <laughs> Hold on. So, so Calvin, let's let's huddle up offline and uh, sort of work out the logistics there. I know we've, uh, uh, there's a uh, there's a very cool plaque that we put names on and stuff like that. We want, to, want to put together a letter. In the past, we've invited them to come to the, uh, uh, the holiday dinner that we're not having this year. <laughs> um, that's okay, no great loss for them. Um, but uh, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and, 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 and make that announcement and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, at some point, maybe try and do some kind of ceremony or something. And we'll think of that. I know Jeff had, had, had uh, uh, given out these awards in the past and so maybe we'll do something similar. But Calvin, uh, can you and I please, we'll huddle up afterwards and figure out how to do that. Uh, yes, okay, I will talk to you. Yes. Thanks, appreciate it. And then uh, moving on to the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Yes, um, and sort of the uh, alumni letters of service and things like that. Um, Roger, thanks for drafting letters there. We can certainly uh, uh, work with that. Um, this is actually a little bit of a, uh, a sensitive issue, but uh, um, I think it's important to, uh, to mention it to, uh, to the commissioners here. Um, our plan was, as we discussed informally, was to give a lifetime achievement award to our, uh, our, our previous chair uh, for his uh, you know, long years of service to the TAC, for which we are you know, very grateful. Um, I will say, though, that I've uh, since heard uh, um, reports, um, uh, 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 credible reports, um, that Jeff has been um, creating a stir since his uh, 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 removal from the uh, from the TAC, um, and uh, uh, making uh, not being particularly respectful of his, his former commissioner, um, it doesn't necessarily prevent us from honoring him for his service on the TAC because he did serve the TAC well and honorably for years. Um, but it is a little troubling to me, and I think it's something that I wanted to. Uh, uh, at least uh, have commissioners have in their minds as we as we discuss this. Did you, did you no mean obligation to give an award right. like this? Just a sec, Roger. We're okay. no obligation to give an award like this if we don't want to, but we certainly can if we choose to. But I wanted uh, folks to be informed. But also, if anybody has views on what they've heard or what they've not heard, I don't want this to be second and third hand. But I wouldn't have been raised this if I didn't have it on uh, with a good source. Um, so, Roger, did you want to start? Yeah, one comment. Do you, uh, when you said he was, he had raised a stir with his former commissioner, did you mean commissioner or a supervisor? Supervisor, I'm sorry. Okay. Supervisor Smith, That's yes. A little. Big difference, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if he was just uh, saying nasty things about us, that'd be okay. Um, uh, you know, uh, as one being in favor of the award, uh, and, and Jeff and I used to, we had a tradition of going out on, uh, on the after the November meeting, which you know coincided with the election, of which there's one every year in Virginia, and uh, uh, you know we would have a drink. He would he, we would always wager a drink on the election, and then you know then we'd have a second drink, so and the other person would pay for that, so it all balanced out. 
Uh, obviously, we're we're not doing that tonight with the pandemic, uh, and I haven't talked to him uh, really since uh, probably since it was announced that he was uh, you know leaving. So I I had not heard any of this, um, and I I don't know what to tell you. I don't want to be unfair to Jeff. I don't you know I my inclination is still to go ahead with the award, but I I haven't heard what you've heard so. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've, I've spoken with Jeff. I um, actually took some yard signs to his house a couple weeks before the election, and I had a nice, you know, social distance conversation in his backyard. Oh, sorry. And okay. I know, um, you know, he he felt that he had been, um, you know, not asked, you know, not invited back to serve on the TAC due to some involvement that he has. Um, with another organization he's involved in with some land use issues in Sully, you know, specifically the new houses they're going to be put in under Dulles Airport. I don't know if anybody's following that or not. Um, I'm aware of it a little bit. What was that? I'm aware of yeah, it. Yeah, we, we were briefed on that, uh, Linda, by the uh, the airport's uh, authority uh, uh, some several months ago. Okay. Some, I mean, yeah, the impact he... that that would have. Yeah, he's he's been involved in some Sully District um, organizations. You know, I, I guess he's been very against, you know, putting in the housing under the airport. And he felt that, you know, and, and obviously, uh, you know, Supervisor Smith was, you know, she's she's a proponent of putting, the, you know, the housing in under the, the flight paths. So he feels that that is the reason that he was not, you know, um, invited back to to head the TAC, which okay. I think is, you know, I mean, it's you know, that that's just what he told me. That's not what I've heard from anyone else. But I'm with Kevin. I mean, you know, he has, you know, he's he's led the committee for a very long time. I you mean, know, Mike, I, I feel you... that he's. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Linda. Oh, I mean, I, I feel that he he did a he did a wonderful job. You know, I, I know I, I I also heard in the past that he'd ruffled some feathers because you know he's he's not afraid to speak up. No, I mean, I I was aware of that uh, position that he's taken, which is not an illegitimate position, and and certainly would not affect the in my mind his ability to receive the award. Um, Mike, can you say whether that's what you heard or you heard something? You know, um, more disparaging. Well, I, the the uh, what I was told that he's been disparaging about Supervisor uh, Smith. Um, and um, guys, I'm sorry. This is this is David, and I hate to interrupt you, Mr. Chairman, but I, I would just remind everyone that this is a this is a public meeting, so we we might want to keep that in mind. Yes, very true. That, that, true. I think um, we had thought yeah. that the public was off of it, but yeah, that's a good point. This is, yeah, as he said, this is being recorded and the public has access to all of this. And I did not uh, um, uh, ask uh, what uh, allowances we have for going in executive session, which is, I think, something that uh, we could do in this in a situation like this. Uh, but David, that's a that's a, a good reminder. Um, um, for what it's worth, when having in other commissions, when we are having discussions on giving awards, mm -hmm. those normally are given executive session. Um, but I don't know necessarily since we are set up virtually um, how we are able to pause that and maybe Calvin can comment. Hey, Calvin, is there a way to turn off the tape machine? <laughs> <laughs> how do we necessarily do it here? Because we want to make sure we're allowed to do it I, for the conversation. Well, but but, I, but I, I will ask, yeah. I'm not sure okay. if, um, but I, I will ask, yes. Okay. He was about to caution you when we were talking about that, but uh, thanks to David, he, he was ahead of me, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad David was sitting in the meeting tonight. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, I know in Zoom meetings, I'm, I'm not familiar with this one, but you can have a breakout session. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman, th there's yeah. a series of procedural motions that would need to be made to go into executive session, uh, okay. sections of the code that would need to be cited. I don't think we're prepared to do that tonight. We are not. We are not. I would um, uh, propose then pushing this subject off until we are prepared to go into that. 
I think that's pretty Mike, let me give you just one quick suggestion that yes. uh, the proposed award be run by Tom Basadney and see if he has, if he thinks there's any objection to it. Uh, I think we need to decide whether we want to give the award first. I think it's first up to us. Uh, okay. Uh, so is that something that we should vote on as a committee? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it seems that we aren't going to be able to have that proper discussion until we are set up to go into executive session, which was why I'm suggesting deferring the subject for right now. You know, the, the alternative is if we determine that it doesn't matter, um, then we can go forward. I would prefer to talk about it a little bit, but I'm not hard over. And, and David, actually, I would, uh, um, you know, give your opinion, uh, you know, great weight um, because you represent the district that, uh, you know, Jeff used to represent. I, I would, I would say you only, you only want to postpone it if you think, uh, there's going to be any more information that didn't already come out, even if it was not an executive session. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I you know, I, I really think that that rather than have this discussion at, at 1023 uh, and, and obviously there's there's some sensitivity here, which I'm which sorry. I'm not going to elaborate on. I, I would really encourage the, the commission to to defer this to a subsequent meeting. Uh, it doesn't seem appear to me to be something that has to be handled tonight. And I, I think it would it would make the most sense to talk with Calvin and count the county attorney, understand what procedural motions need to be made to go into executive session and then have that discussion uh, in in a in a closed session. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a motion at this point that we defer this topic to the 15 December meeting. Uh, I'll second. I'll, second. Can I, I'll throw it. In. <laughs> I had a, uh, a motion a to defer this question. To the conversation. Are we uh, are we out of discussion? I just had a general question. Yes, Chairman. I do we so are you coming to this late? Do is. We have funding to do this. Or is, is it the is FC dot need to improve some kind of funding for us to give an award? Uh, um, it's it's I like a black uh, I have about fifty dollars <laughs> by the <laughs> perfect the uh, the black. But uh, last year we ran like over the amount, and uh, I get into trouble for that. So we might have to look for something that would be less expensive. <laughs> So, it would not be similar no, to the, really the, the one that, that we gave out in the previous year. We might have to go for a, you know, cheaper material. Okay. Uh, I was thinking, I didn't realize certificates were that expensive, but good question, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, may, okay. Maybe that's a topic also for the executive session, folks. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. And um, at, that, at that time, I'll ask if we could make a contribution if we wanted to, but I'll defer it for executive session. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I tell you what, there is a motion on the floor seconded to delay the discussion of the TAC Achievement Award uh, until executive session at our next meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll delay it. Uh, Calvin, uh, you and I work together to uh, approach the county attorney about what uh, what steps we need to take to uh, to make this happen. Um, and uh, uh, David, thank you for your uh, um, your your glove save there. I apologize for not raising this issue prior to bringing up the meeting. That was my bad. So thank you for uh, uh, bringing us back here. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, it is late. Um, we have an opportunity here for uh, uh, commissioners updates, um, calling upon the commissioners, whatever. Um, I would like to uh, allow commissioners to uh, uh, make any uh, statements they want, knowing that it is is late. And apologies once again for that. Um, shall I, I? What I'll do is I'll go through the list, call your name. If you've got anything, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll move on. 
of uh, Commissioner Sperling. Nothing, nothing else to cover this evening. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Morse. Just wanted to ask, are the are the letters uh, to the former commissioners going out? And if so, can we get a copy? Um, I'm actually uh, uh, holding off on the letter because uh, um, I do have them for the other commissioners, but wanted to understand what we want to do with uh, with Jeff first. But yes, we got uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. That's that's all I have. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Glenn. Nothing more tonight. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Hoskin. Take that as a no. Um, Commissioner Sitnick. Oh, pass. I had myself. Okay, on. there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Sitnick. Uh, nothing to for this evening, but th yeah, I thought it was a great meeting. Thanks. <laughs> Um, Commissioner Hancock. Nothing for me. Commissioner Thiel. Fine, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Scott Biles. Uh, no update. Okay, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Vice Chair Jones. Um, motion to adjourn. All right. Um, do I hear a second? Second. A second. Finally. Third. All right. Um, Hearing a uh, motion and seconded to adjourn. Uh, any discussion on the motion? I didn't think so. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. 1029, we are adjourned. Uh, we'll follow up afterwards. Look forward to talking to you uh, next month. Good night. Good night. Good night. Everybody be safe. Good night. Yes.